Welcome back to the Gill Athletics Track and Field Connections podcast. If you joined us last week, we kicked off our two-parter here, if you will. We had Ernst Martinez, the USTF CCCA Girls National Coach of the Year. By the way, these Coaches of the Year from USTF CCA are presented by the U.S. Marines. And so just want to give a shout out to the U.S. Marines for supporting track and field, supporting track and field coaches. So blessed and honored that they would uh, come along this um, uh, this award here with USTF CCA and help on. Uh, coaches from around the country, their state meet coaches, and then the national coaches. So last week, if you didn't go check it out, go listen to Ernest Martinez. Awesome, awesome story down there in New Mexico. And we're going to do the flip side now. So now we've got part two. So help me welcome the USTF CCCA National Boys Coach of the Year from gorgeous Snow Canyon High School. I said that like I've been there. I just assume Utah, it's gorgeous. I just know it is. Help me welcome the wise, the wonderful Mr. Justin Redfern. Justin, how are you, sir? Excellent. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Uh, I assume it's gorgeous. I, I just, I've been to Utah once and it was unbelievable. So Snow Canyon just sounds like it's unbelievable. Yeah, we've got a, several national parks and state parks around. Uh, Zion National Park is within about a half an hour. Oh. Of course, the Grand Canyon is not very far as well. Um, we're about two hours northeast of Vegas. So uh, okay. still some desert, but a little higher altitude and we don't have the brown desert. We have the nice red desert and, and white desert. So it's what we call color country down through these southern Utah. You said two and a half hours northeast of Vegas. I actually, the, the one time I did, I did a big trip. I flew into Vegas and went up and did um, southern Utah University all the way up yep. to Utah State. So I got to see the whole thing. It was gorgeous. Didn't go east, of course, but all the way up through uh, Salt Lake City, BYU, University of Utah. Wh where are you kind of on that corridor? Are you more so we would be before southern Utah University. So on your way. So just past the border of Arizona and Utah. So just okay. the border, uh, we were about six to 10 miles uh, north of the Utah, Arizona border. Yeah. Okay. I know where you're at then. So you yeah. would have come right through I-15 and gone right through there. Yeah. Well, then I know because yeah. I remember I, I got in late to um, Southern Utah University. What, what's, what town is that in? Um, uh, Cedar City, Utah. Cedar City. And so, you know, went to the hotel and woke up the next morning and kind of, you know, opened the curtains. And I was just like, holy cow, like I missed everything because I came in during the dark. I was like, well, this place is amazing. And then it was an entire trip of just wows. I mean, just the, the mountains felt like I could just touch them. They were right there all the way yeah. through, especially as we got up to the valley in uh, Utah State, Logan, Logan area up there, man. It's amazing. Are, are you from Utah originally? I'm not. I'm actually from Northern California, Stockton, okay. California. Yeah. All right. Well, Justin, first of all, congratulations, man. Um, you know, I, I don't envy committees that have to choose a national coach of the year, whether uh, it, it's a little easier on the NCAA side, right? Because there's a there's a national championship meet. So maybe you just automatically defer to the winner because that's amazing to win that meet on the high school level. Heck, we don't even compete our best teams and athletes in the same state in one big state meet in, in most of them, right? So impossible task. It's unbelievable. But when you do win it, whoever does win it and you're this year's winner, it is amazing because it takes something to shine and, and have a, a, a program and athletes and staff to win. I assume you win the state meet and we'll talk about those here in a little while, but congratulations, man. This is a huge deal. This is awesome, man. It's huge. And I, I, I very humbled by it. Um, did not expect anything like this to ever come my way. Uh, I didn't get into coaching for things of this nature. And I don't think really any coach, says, hey, I want to get into this so hopefully I can win something for, from a personal standpoint. Um, yeah, I mean, for our program to be recognized on a national level, I just, I think it's kind of every coach's dream, you know, to get to a point like that. It's um, to feel some validation to the time and effort that not only that individually I'm putting in, but certainly my coaching staff and boosters and parents and, and of course, the athletes themselves. Um yeah, it's a lot of hard work. And, and and again, I'm not saying anything that any other coach at any other program at, throughout the nation is not doing. And and so for to be recognized, uh, yeah, it's truly humbling. Um, um, and I'm very grateful for an opportunity like this. That's awesome. Well, we're going to learn more about this magical season that culminated in this award. But first, we'd like to get to know you a little bit better. We always like to know the journey of our different guests. We found that there is no 
one path. You, you might guess that there's like a, an average path. I don't think there is an average path. There is so many different ways to get to where we are today. Why don't we start with you? Where does coaching and track and field start for you? Well, it started when I was competing and in the high school level. Um, I was in Stockton, California, and, and we were actually bused into Lodi, California, because of just the growth that was going on in California in the 80s. Um, and so I was I was blessed to be a part of a really great program, uh, very diverse from a coaching staff as well as all athletes. It was a great community uh, of, of, again, coaches and athletes. And I, uh, I learned to... I learned not only about myself and, and where I kind of fall into this whole thing of competing and training and, and being taught and being coached. Um, but then I also, um, I, I like to watch. And so when I naturally, I just started watching my coaches and how my coaches interacted, not only with me, but with my teammates um, and the culture that was created. Uh, and it was a really positive and uplifting culture. And, uh, I, I just thrived in it. I, mentally, I thrived in it. You know, some days, you know, just like with anything, I racing wise, I had my ups and downs like everyone. But, um, but I, I, uh, I loved the culture that I was being trained in and coached under. And I think that's really where the grassroots foundation came for me. Uh, my head coach at the time and uh, Coach Israel, uh, Ken Israel, he was an amazing man. Um, he wouldn't wow you with any of his athletic prowess. And he'd be the first to tell you that he's probably not the most gifted of athletes or of anything, but he had a way with people and he had a way to communicate and bring in a, a very diverse culture and a group of, of athletes. And, um, and we thrived, we thrived under him. You know, I, I sit in a pretty unique chair. First of all, my whole job is to talk to coaches, high school and college around the country every day. Uh, and then here, you know, over 200 and something episodes, I've gotten real deep into a lot of coaches. And one of the commonalities that I have been able to kind of pick from coaches is the really, really good ones. And there's some great ones The just a little bit different notch up. They are all observers. I like how you said that you were an observer. Tell me more about that. Did you, was, was that track specific or did you notice that? trait of yours and other sports you might have played or even um, English class or your parents? Were you kind of a, a natural observer, kind of sitting back and seeing how things play? Uh, I, yes, I think initially, yes. Um, you know, from my youth, I, I, I felt like I could watch a demonstration of some sports or an activity that I was doing at a young age. And I felt like if I could watch what was being done and what the purpose of the activity was, I felt like I could pretty much replicate that. Hmm. And then, and then of course, self upset, observe my own. Okay. Hmm. So now what do I need to do? Oh, you know, and, and how do I need to adapt to the situation? So I think there was some of that innate, um, you know, ability to recognize what was going on and, and doing that. Um, my parents both are have a lot of attention to detail and activities and things that they do. And I, I, I'm certainly uh, grateful for them and, and their guidance along, you know, sticking to the task and not giving up on something, staying persistent and putting forth a, a good effort consistently. Mm -hmm. And and so I think that combination of just my own instinct of, mm -hmm. of wanting to learn, you know, how to do something at a higher level uh, innately. So. You mentioned the culture that Coach Israel brought to the program. Can you give us an example of what that, what the positive side of that, what something you remember, uh, whether it was a, uh, the way he spoke to the team, an example he gave, uh, maybe how he picked captains? What was a, a, an example of that positive culture? Okay, now you're testing me a little bit. Now you're getting on 40 years of <laughs> you know, going some things almost. Um, but, you know, the thing that stood out to me was Coach Israel. Uh, he was not a giant by stature. I, I, I think he maybe he was five, seven, five, eight. He was not a very big man, but man, he had a big personality and he was very, um, a little bit flamboyant, but, but, but reserved. I mean, he, he, uh, he would get excited with you, with your success. So he would celebrate your success with you. Um, and never once. And I, and, and I, again, I'm, I guess in a way I'm now speaking for all my other teammates out there during that time. And, and I it may not be the, always the case for them, but I felt that he 
did a great job including everyone in everything. Hmm. He celebrated all of our successes. Um, uh, you know, he took time out of practice to do that. And, uh, and he did a, he did a, a newsletter. He, we called it, we were the Toke Tigers. That was the name of our high school. And uh, he called it the, the, the little letter that he put together each week called Tiger Tracks. And he would try to celebrate and do a synopsis of our meet the week before and kind of some records or moving up and down. But he just did a great job, I, I believe, of just including so many people, so many diverse cultures and national, you know, and people and nationalities and and just a great job making us all feel like we were all important, that we were all together in this, uh, that our success was built upon each other, whether it was the success of our high jumpers and pole vaulters and throwers and our sprinters and our distance runners. I, I think, you know, I, I remember watching, you know, jumpers stop their jump while we were running by in the, you know, in the half mile and the mile hmm. and cheering us on. I mean, I remember personally going to some other the other events to watch them and cheer on my teammates. And that's the part of the culture that I've tried to create in, in Snow Canyon and in this program. And and that, you know, no one part of the program is above the other, that we work together and we can support and encourage one another. And and um, and good things are happening as a result of that. And that was all started by Coach Israel, in my opinion, and, and the other coaches. Obviously, they had to jump in and buy into that. I right. I don't ever remember hearing a coach, you know, talk back, talk down to another coach or other athletes. Uh, you know, everyone was supportive of one another. I like that he uh, started a uh, manual email newsletter back then. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. really he had, and, and he, he, it, they were detailed. I mean, it wasn't just like giving bullets. I I, I feel like I would be a bullet guy, just like yeah, yeah for sure. Kind of basics. <laughs> I don't have time to do all this, but he was elaborate <laughs> with it. He, had a, he was a good storyteller with it and he did an amazing job of, uh, it, like I said, just having some fun with it. Yeah. Uh, it was fun to get. I, I, I mean, I remember him. I kept him. You know, I, I, it's, it's part of a little remembrance book or whatever of, of things that I, um, and I look back fondly on those things, That's whether awesome. my name was mentioned in there or not, just even remembering my teammates and even remembering what they did to have that recognition. So it was I, you know, our sport is tough compared to uh, football, baseball, volleyball uh, regarding the team, right? It's very easy for us to fall into individualistic patterns. You know, the sprinters over here, the throwers over there. So I'm always appreciative of a coach that uh, sounds like he was very intentional on, we are a team. You may go do the sprint and you may go do the jump, but at the end of the day, we're, we're a team first and foremost. I really like that intentionality. And, and it was, and that's what we try to do here with our program. Awesome. So as you go through high school, uh, assuming you went to college, you're a teacher, so I, that's a pretty good assumption. What was, uh, so where'd you end up going? And more importantly, at this point, what did you think you were going to go to be in college? Did you, you know, you're going to go become an accountant or a business major or, or a teacher? What, what did you think as you first went in? Well, so I ended up at Southern Utah University. Oh, it was yeah. actually uh, Southern Utah State College. It was the last mm. year that they were a state college before becoming the university. So I was there when they when they had the voting to approve SUU at that time. Um, and I just was there for one year. Mm. Uh, I only ran one year. Uh, after that, I, I served a, a two-year LDS mission. Uh, and so when I came back from that, I decided to you know, not pursue the athletic side of my mm -hmm. college career at that point. I felt like I needed to move in a different direction at, at, at that time. Um, I, I, unconventional route to becoming a teacher and coach. <laughs> okay. Um, ironically, I knew in fourth grade that I wanted to be a PE teacher. <laughs> wait, wait, fourth <laughs> grade? It, it was, seriously. So both my parents- Wait, wait, well, teachers, when I was in fourth grade, I wanted to be a fireman, an astronaut, probably a police officer. You yeah. knew then- Okay, I'm so going to be a PT. Let, let me tell you the why. Okay, All so right. now my nine-year-old brain, or yep. oh, yeah, and I, I don't think I was even ten at that point. I was quite nine years old. I had my first PE teacher, right? Actually, just assigned to be our PE teacher. Okay. And I remember going up to her saying, "You get paid to play with us," <laughs> and she's like, "Yeah, I do." And I was like, "That's what I want to do." Like to me, that was like, that was the greatest thing I'd ever heard. That's I got. She got paid to play games. 
That reminds like, me who of doesn't the, want to play to get paid and to play games. So that reminds me. Of I the, knew then that I was like, "Hey, I, this is what I want to do." And I think also, you know, with that, some things we talked about already. My ability to kind of observe, step back, mm. watch, see what's happening. Because of that as well, I thought, "Oh, okay, I could probably teach that." After it was explained to me, if I had to explain it to somebody else, I right. felt like I could do it. And and again, I. I don't know. It's not like I consciously thought of that. It's not like I said, okay, this is what I'm planning on doing. It was just innate. It was just something that came to me that says, okay, watch the fundamentals. What are the basic, you know, rules and fundamentals that need to happen here? Okay. And let's go and try to execute it. And then it was like, okay, now I know what my opponent's trying to do now. So now I need to counteract hmm. that. And it was just, again, I don't think it was something necessarily taught to me. It was just something that maybe it was competitive instinct. I don't mm -hmm. know kind of kicked in with that but um so after after serving that that church mission for two years i uh i came back and like i said i decided to go a little different direction and so i ended up um going in the real estate world and i was in a real estate agent for 19 years here in the state of utah oh so, so real estate agent and no track and field no coaching really Nothing. Nothing. interesting so i went into that real estate field and development and so i was i was in that and i really had an enjoyable time with that and and uh and it was a lot of fun i mean it was i mean obviously a lot of hard work like any job is but when you're self-employed and you're having to push through things and make things happen you got to do it and so um, i learned another skill set of sticking to the task and really pushing through things once you make a commitment to it uh that it's not going to just be easy it's not going to you know, just because I have my license, my, I'm going to set my phone right here. All of a sudden, my phone's <laughs> going to start ringing with business. You right. know what I mean? So you quickly, and it, and again, goes back to that same observing. I watched my other agents, how they were doing things, what they were doing. I was asking questions and then jumping right in and, and doing it. So do you th think during that 19 years, my, my first thought is where was track for you though, as a, as a fan, obviously there's no coaching, but were you still like, you know, every Olympics I'm watching every, did you go to the local high school and watch a track? Where was track okay, as a so fan? It's funny. You're talking about this year. I think you're in my head a little bit right now. <laughs> is, so this is why I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> I, I was an absolute track junkie. I've yeah. been that way since my whole All right. I, I guess stepping back just slightly, I, I loved watching the human body perform, mm -hmm. whether it was a high jump, whether it was a pole vault, whether it was a long jump. I mean, you sit there and you look at what these athletes do. And even, even at the high school level, mm -hmm. what some of these athletes are doing, especially Absolutely. now. I mean, we're talking, I mean, you know, back in my day, you know, they were talking about the four minute mile, right? And how many, a few people were even doing that. <laughs> now we have regularly high school athletes not only beating that, but n numerous athletes on the verge of beating that and yep. stuff. And so, so watching what the human body can do, I was always amazed at that. And I just, I was in awe hmm. at all the events, throwing the shot put and discus. And it's like, how do they do that? And anyway, I just was amazed. And so my, I, I was a junkie. I would, I would, I would, I went to the Utah state meet over and over every opportunity I got, I would go to BYU and just watch their college meets at times i'm sitting in the stands sometimes in my suit from real estate sometimes <laughs> in some khakis and other things and i've got my stopwatch there even though they've got the electronic timing and i'm getting splits and i'm checking things i'm i'm trying to you know anticipate what maybe some splits were or even if some of the sprinters you know uh, you know 50 meter splits and things like yeah. that Anyway, I, I loved it. I, I, I followed it online. I even would follow back in California what was going on there, even my own wow. high school, what athletes were doing. So I've been a junkie as far as following track and field for years. And, uh, you know, when I, whenever I get a new TV or a new service, first thing I do is go in and make sure that track and field, anything track and field comes up as recorded. <laughs> I, uh, so if that tells you anything, I, yeah, I, I like I, the I, love I, love I like the stopwatch analogy. That that to me oh. is you know there, there's fans of track and field, and then there's people who have their stopwatch and are doing every lap, every split. The, the equivalent on the field event is the guys who draw their own um, uh, uh, sheet. You know, are doing the X's yeah. and O's. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, no, you you aren't a fan. That's a that's a super fan. That's a different <laughs> level uh, up there. That's awesome. I'm sure, I had a few weird looks in the stands from people. Sure. Who's this guy? And why yeah. is he all dressed up? But <laughs> sitting out in the stands in a hot track meeting right, right. anyway but i i loved it i i uh i love watching the athletes i love watching the sport i just love what uh 
you know, watching what they're doing. Real estate agent. I've never been one, but from the outside, I've used a couple. <laughs> uh, it, I'm curious, you know, it seems like when I say it seems like I don't believe this because I know enough real estate agents, but it, the, the culture, the outside culture, people who are not real estate agents, it kind of feels like, oh, that's an easy job to do. Like, you know, a lot of people want to get their real estate license and things like that. I know it's not because I know it's not. I'm curious, were there any things that you picked up either as an athlete or an observer of coach and, and your coaching staffs that helped you be, during your real estate career? Does that make sense? I don't know. Um, I think it's almost the opposite. I think a lot of the things I'm doing as a coach now, um, interesting things I learned in real estate uh, has helped me. Yeah. Uh, okay. With people with such a diverse group of different people coming yeah. in. Um, and I'm not talking diverse from price range standpoint. I'm just talking about people and hmm. their personalities and traits and, and, sure. and what motivates them, what inspires them and what does things. So yeah. I, I, uh, and, and not just people that I would be working with, but also lenders and mm. title uh, people, title loan officers mm -hmm. and, and title officers and everyone that's involved in the process and how all of those things need to work together. So I think I learned a lot of the importance of, of creating a, a team and making sure you had a team of people that you trusted, but then also let them do their thing and not micromanage them mm. and not stay on them constantly. And, uh, I mean, you have to still stay on things and, and make sure, you know, you have deadlines and things that need to happen, but I think there's an importance of letting people govern themselves and, uh, let this process happen, um, and be supportive of them. I, I remember many times, you know, my conversations along the lines of what can I do to help? How can I help you get the things that you need to get done? And even though it wasn't necessarily directly anything that I I needed to do as far as my responsibilities, but if I could help that other person be successful, get things done in a timely fashion, then it makes that whole team of people look really good and efficient. Mm. And so I think it was probably the opposite. I think I learned a yeah. little bit more on the real estate side that prepared me for coaching than vice versa. Okay. Before we move past what was past real estate and how we get into actual coaching, uh, you know, we always you know, the, the main goal here uh, in the Gill Connections podcast is to uplift and honor your journey. The secondary goal is to bring immense value to those we are so humbled to listen to us. So oh, hopefully almost everyone that's listening is either going to buy or sell a home at some point or multiples in their life, right? With with today's prices, I, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, well, in today's world, it's a little, that's why I say maybe hopefully everybody, because it's a whole right. different world today. Uh, what is the best piece of advice? Almost 20 years of buying and selling homes, working with a team, working with diverse people with different motivations on selling and buying homes and what they're looking for. What's the best piece of advice you can give a seller and a buyer? <laughs> well, well, there's an old saying in real estate, buyers are liars and sellers are worse. <laughs> sellers so, are worse? <laughs> so I think uh, from that standpoint, I, the first thing is transparency and honesty. When you're okay. dealing with a big purchase of people's lives, I think the first thing is you got to make sure people are, are honest in their dealings with one another, um, being upfront about everything. Uh, there's no reason to hide anything. And obviously hiding things can get you in a lot of trouble. So from that standpoint, from a buyer standpoint and a selling standpoint, um, be upfront, be honest with each other. And uh, you're very likely to have a very nice, smooth transaction and, and, uh, and have a good experience in it. It's when people start trying to deceive one another or skirt the rules mm. or laws or things like that, or just being deceitful. It, 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 it doesn't go anywhere and it leaves a bad reputation for not for them as well as, as others involved. And, and that goes right with real estate agents as well. Mm. Real estate agents have to work together with other ones. And so even though you have fiduciary responsibility to your buyer or seller, whoever you're working with, uh, you, you've got to be upfront and honest with everyone involved and, uh, if you do that, then good things will happen. I thought you were going to tell me like bake cookies during your open house or something. I, hey, you know. it's that's always a good idea, especially for the real estate agent. Put a few <laughs> off to the side for them, especially if they're doing <laughs> open house and have to be there for four hours. I love yeah. it. Well, it's a very rewarding, you know, um, homes are very important for people and for their legacy and for generations. So I, I do, uh, you know, have a, a lot of love for the, the whole process. Um, so after 19 years, you know, you, you were, I can, you know, I can only imagine, 
you, you know, you had to help people with their first homes ever. Uh, you know, we talk about like with kids, their first time out of their family going to college. Well, there are certainly people who first time they've owned a house. Same, I'm the first generation homeowner in, in my family. That's a special thing. It really is. After 19 years, why get out and what do we do next? You know, a lot of people have asked me that. Um, I, I was successful in the real estate world. I, I did I did really well. Um, and it came down to a few things, I think, for me. Um, part of it was um, it was I was losing some passion. And what I mean by mm. that is not that I was losing the idea of getting up every morning and going to work and, and doing a great job. Um, it became pretty tiring. There's, a, you know, in the fact that, you know, some of the people that you work with, they, um, they change when it comes to money mm -hmm. and the way they deal with you and the way they look at you. Um, meaning, um, this is a lot of ungratefulness. There was a lot of things, you know, you're providing a service for people and you're doing it. You're doing your very best to do that. And you're being upfront and honest and, 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 and following the law and the rules and all the things necessary. And just sometimes it got, it got to a point where I felt unappreciated and uh, money didn't, I, the money doesn't, I never got into it for the money in the first place. Uh, is the money good? Yeah, it can be really good. Um, and it was, but I started losing my why a little bit. Um, it wasn't because I never got into it for the money. I, I got into it to provide for the needs of my family but I didn't get into it for certain accolades or honors. You know, I, I just, and I wasn't consumed by the dollar from that standpoint. I was consumed about helping my customers give them the best experience that I knew how to. And keep in mind, when I got into the business, I had never bought a home myself. You know? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was young. So, you know what I mean? So I was learning about that process as well. So I it was always about my clients for me. It was never about money or accolades or stature or anything like that. So, so I, I, I kind of lost my fire, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I, I lost that desire because it was not, it wasn't, it wasn't fun anymore for me. It was becoming, I, I felt like I was just constantly dealing with someone's ego mm -hmm. and um, and then, and then, like I said, I, I don't know if it was the time at the society, but there was a lot of ungratefulness for everything. And, you know, when I, you do an amazing job and you get things done, even in a timely fashion, then people were asking me, well, you didn't have to work as hard on this one. So you should be cutting things and doing things. And it's like, you always felt like somebody was like unappreciative and ungrateful mm -hmm. for what you guys done. And so I, you know, you just, it just wears on you. It wore on me it, from a personal standpoint, it just wore on me. And I felt like I, um, wasn't valued, hmm. and uh, even though I was making good money and and doing just fine, financially. so you're so. so you're you're feeling undervalued, uh, maybe taken advantage of a little bit, underappreciated, and you decide to go coach teenagers. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure I'm connecting yeah. the dot. I just want to make no, sure I'm connecting no, the dots no, here. Now <laughs> go back to school. Oh right, years old. go back to school to actually finish. Oh really? Oh yes. Oh, I didn't even think about that. You had to go back and get a degree, a, a education I had to go degree. Back. In fact, so then I'm driving back to SUU. So now I'm in St. George and Santa Clara, and I'm driving an hour each way to go back. And I'm taking 21 credit hours. Wow. 18 and 21. So I had 18 a couple of times and 21. And then I was doing things during the summer. So I didn't have the time and the luxury of waiting, you know, like a 19, 20, 21, 22 year old. Right. I had to get done. Yeah. And so I, yeah. I went back to school in my at four years old and, and, uh, what, what was that experience like? That's in, you know, that, that's not something a lot of people have. We either go in at 18 and end at 22 or 23, you know, depending on how many years it takes us, uh, or we don't go, or we go back to night school and take a class or two. And, and that's always amazing. Like I, I'm actually, um, yeah, I did the, uh, I did kind of the traditional route as far as, you know, went in and, and got out in four or five years. 
uh, I had a couple of years in between, but, um, but anytime someone goes a year or two and then 10, 20, 30 years later, a family, et cetera, and either night school, I, I'm not picking whether I, I love how you force fed it, 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 you know, into a couple of semesters, but even those who take one class, two class a semester and, and, you know, grind it out and get it done. It is amazing to me. I could not imagine today. I'm 47 years old. I could not imagine today going to school and, and that's what you were doing. Uh, what, what's that experience like going back to school well i'll tell you what it, it took my ego to get set off to the side mm. i mean you know you're going with, in with kids that i mean I, I almost have kids that age well not quite at that time but you know my kids were certainly getting older and and uh yeah i mean you're in there and you're like i could be some of your parents <laughs> so um you know especially those 19 year olds you know mm -hmm. years old i could easily have been their parent potentially mm -hmm. so yeah it it was it was it was um uh, it was humbling that way, but it was also, uh, it gave me that fire again. I, I gave me the fire that I felt like I lost in real estate. It gave me that, okay, this is exciting. I'm, I feel like I, I'm on a purpose again. I feel like I'm being appreciated again. I feel like I'm going in a direction. And, I, and when I was in real estate, I knew at some point I was going to be a coach. I knew that at some point I was going to make a change. You know, I knew real estate I could I could do till I died if I needed to. Hmm. I mean, there's not a time frame. You can go till whenever. So I always knew that at some point I was gonna have some sort of transition in my life, whether it was a full going in full time as a teacher right. or just helping out as a coach, whether it was an assistant, or if they wanted me to be a head coach, I would do that. But I knew at some point I was gonna go do some coaching. Hmm. And it just came down to it. It's just like, you know what? It's time. It's time to make this change and do this. I was feeling excited again. I was feeling like, you know, I had a purpose again. I was, you know, what, I don't know, your midlife crisis, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> hey, well, I, at, least, I, so, at least that was your so midlife crisis. Yeah, yeah. Back to school. <laughs> I mean, whatever, right? So I, so I did that. And, and I had, I had great professors. Um, they, 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 they actually, they actually were very accommodating to me. And what I mean by that is, they didn't treat me like I was 21, hmm. all right, or 19 or whatever, like most of my colleagues were there at school. So they actually did reach out to me on experiences. Now, my degree at SUU, SUU actually has, it's a physical education degree with an emphasis in coaching. Hmm. So there's a lot of classes that are strictly coaching related. And so at that time, I had already started to do some coaching, and I guess we'll get to that in a little bit, but... Um, they actually would lean on me a little bit about my experiences, hmm. whether it was with parents, with athletes, with training, with training cycles and other things like that. And so um, I was one of the few in the room that was actually already starting that process. Hmm. And so, so I think that felt good a little bit that I wasn't looked down upon or that hmm. what I was doing wasn't right. Um, they, and I, and I, and I wasn't one that was saying, I know more than the teacher hmm. does. It wasn't one of those types of situations either. I would certainly ask them questions. And I even talked to them a few of them after, like, how, what would you do with this athlete? I have an athlete that's kind of doing some of these things right now or, or struggling in this area. How would you handle that? What would you do? Here's what I can give you. And so I kind of collaborated with them. Hmm. And so there was a good, I think there, I felt like there was a good relationship, you know, with, with me going back to school with my professors and then also the students, they were fantastic. Hmm. They did a great job. I never once felt like, I was this old guy in the class. They treated me like one of their own. In fact, the one guy, I kind of joked with the teacher. Um, I was, we had to take a test in one of my classes on my birthday. And I said, hey, can I get the, can we get the answer to number 40 for this one? And, he's, and they're like, 40? Why 40? And I'm like, because it's my birthday today. It's today's 40th. Awesome. And then a student in front of me, he turns around and he goes, you're 40? He just blew his mind. In fact, the, 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 towards the end of the test, he turned back and he goes, 40? He thought I was like 26, 27 years old. He knew I was older than them, but he had no idea. And it just blew his mind. So anyway, it was a, it was good. It was a good relationship there. The students were welcoming. They never felt, made me feel like, you know, here's this old idiot up here. He doesn't know what he's doing with his life or whatever. You know what I mean? I, I felt yeah. good, accepted. Um, and, but then also respected too. I did have some experience and they did ask me at different things. I mean, even about kids. Some of them had some young kids. Yeah. at the time and they're asking me about my kids and what I would you know and helping them a little bit so 
I, I look back on that experience as, again as another good learning experience, a uh, life experience that has helped shape who I am today. You know, when we were that age, we thought 40 year olds were like one foot in the grave. And then when we become 40 year olds and above, it's like, oh, man, I've never felt better. Like, I'm not in the grave. I still got 30 more years before I start worrying about that. You know, it's it's really perspective is an amazing tool, a, a great educator. <laughs> it is, so you were you started coaching during this time as well. So you, you didn't you weren't busy enough with 18 and 21 credit hour. You decided and, and family and life. You decided, well, let's go ahead and jump right into this coaching thing. Yeah, so I started coaching some local youth here in the Hershey <clears throat> track and field when, when Hershey oh, yeah. had their own meet back in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. And so it started coaching with a few relay teams and a few individuals doing some things. And we had some success. And we got to go back to Hershey and, and run there and do that. And and so what became one relay team then became, you know, a, a second team. And then it became all the age groups. So I started with the girls team. Um, and then it started with then it became all the girls. So the nine and 10 year girls, the 11 and 12 year girls, the 13, 14 year oh. girls. And then it became the parents and others were like, Hey, we don't coach the guys too. The girls are doing really good. In fact, they're beating some of these guys teams. Can, can, uh, can you help coach our guys too? So then I started coaching all the boys as well. And then it became, Hey, um, we need to take this to another level more than just what Hershey was providing. And uh, so that's when I started uh, my quick feet track and field program through USA track and field. And, um, and we started, we started going, I started coaching everything. I went and got my certifications through USATF uh, and um, started the club and, and then it just started taking off. And uh, we had some incredible athletes coming through and developing from our small community here in, in Southern Utah and Washington County, Utah. And, and uh, we had some big success at the national stages, some of these young athletes. And, and uh, so that's really started the coaching and taking off. You know, for someone who, you know, did the sport, went away from the sport, went into a whole different career, but always it felt like, I think I heard you say, I always knew I was going to do something. I, th I always kind of thought I was going to coach. Like there was going to be something there. Yeah. So it kind of was always in your belly of like, I'm going to be a coach. And then you get your first opportunity to actually coach and you're coaching uh, little kids, little, little kids, right? Do you, is, do you remember a time during that span, that first, could be the first week, could be the first season uh, where it was like, oh yeah, like I, I have been searching for this the whole oh, time. There's no question. No question. As soon as I, uh, as soon as I started coaching, I just, I felt like this is my element. This is mm -hmm. where I need to be. And uh, um. And that's one reason why going back to school became a big priority because I started coaching those little Hershey programs and the kids before I made it official to go back to school. Oh, and So then it was like, okay, now I need to get done. Let's push through this. Let's get through this. Um, it became a huge priority in my life to get done with school, uh, to get officially in the teaching and coaching. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, and it was nice to know that the stability of an income for my family was going to come through the of teaching side of it and insurance and other things. Again, I, money, like I told you, I never got involved in real estate for the money in the first place. At that point, it was just taking care of the needs of my family, mm -hmm. uh, the physical needs of my family. And, and uh, we can live within our means. We know how to do that. And so um, so that's where, yeah, I became passionate of that. Go after this. Let's go do this. And And I jumped in with two feet and I just, I haven't looked back. You know, uh, so I coached high school track and field and collegiate track and field. And my first year here at Gill, uh, a local summer club asked, you know, they found out I coached in the SEC, you know, like, oh, you, you want to help? And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I hadn't I, I missed it still. So I it's like, sure, I'll help. And, you know, I find myself for the first time ever coaching eight year olds, nine year olds, 10 year olds. It always been high schoolers. And then the vast, vast majority were collegians. And I found out I can't do that. I'm, I'm, it, there's a special person that can do that. How, so really my question is, how how did you do that? The the young ones that you're working with, that is a, and maybe, well, and maybe you I, didn't know, you, you know, you hadn't coached high school or, yeah. you, know, you know, so maybe this is just, you just, oh, this is just how it is. It takes a special person to coach these young ones. Oh, well, it's a lot of patience. <laughs> there's no question about that. Um, but I also think that they were perfect for me to learn on. I think, uh, and what I mean by that is 
they they had such a zest for life at that point, right? They were excited to come to practice. I mean, and I, it wasn't like we were killing them, but we were putting them through. I mean, I w- we were teaching them and we were pushing them a little bit. And I just, I became obsessed a little bit with their success. Hmm. And I just wanted to help them be as successful as I could, not just in, in the performance on, on the track, but just as young humans learning this thing called life and how to deal with themselves and their own emotions that are going through them, as well as how to work with teammates and how come those teammates or how those teammates are so important to their success. If they want to be successful, it can't just be by themselves. They've got to have the right people around them and the teammates around them. And so I tried to create a culture that I felt was important. What I felt like was successful to me when I was younger um, and what helped me when I was younger. Um, So I just, it just became an, an obsession a little bit of helping them in all facets of their life. And, um, and I mean, I had, we had some hard conversations with, with kids, you know, some that were struggling and making some bad decisions in school or even with their parents or and siblings, even teammates in some aspects. Also, I had to deal with some parents, yeah, you know, that were creating problems. Mm-hmm. You know, I had some situation with another sport where I had a lot of athletes from a different sport that were kind of on the same team. And then they came over to get this training done um, on track and field. And they were successful track and field athletes as well, but they had some issues with each other. And so here I am having to take what was a problem in another sport Mm -hmm. and to try to, you know, make sure everyone's safe and and in a good environment, positive environment. And, uh, you know, you had to deal with some parents sometimes on things like that. Hey, I don't want my kid rooming with this one or you know when we were going to junior olympics and things like that or i don't want them traveling or you know by you know anyway if you know and it's like these kids are nine or ten or twelve years old right it's like you let me when because they're around me and they're in my, our environment these issues are not here right and these whether young men or young or late young ladies they're interacting with each other they are supporting one another they're encouraging one another and all the drama that's happening, wherever it's happening, is not happening here. Mm. And we we just wouldn't allow that to fester into our environment and culture that we're trying to create. And so, um, but you know, that's part of coaching. It's part yeah. of dealing with all those things. And so I think, um, you know, my drive and passion was, was just helping these athletes. I just wanted every one of them. And I just wanted them to see that, that they had more in them than they thought they did and that they could do harder things than they thought they could ever do in their life. And if I could get a kid to learn that at nine and 10 years old, man, what a life lesson for a long period of time in their life. And so that's where the passion came from. You mentioned taking it to the next level. I'm a big coach and education nerd, if you will. Like I'm a huge, huge advocate of it. It changed my life, changed my coaching career and my life as I went through different coaching education. You said you took level one. Do you remember taking level one and who, yeah. who, do you remember who the teachers were? So I did it. And, uh, at, uh, Hayward, California. So I drove back to okay. Hayward, California, mm-hmm. which was Shabot college yep. there, uh, in, in the Oakland area. Um, there were several teachers there. I'm trying to yeah. remember. Yeah. I know. I'm putting you on um, the spot with that Ken, one. Yeah, Ken yeah. Grace, Ken Grace. Yeah. Coach uh-huh. Grace was okay. One of them. Yeah. Um, and actually we've stayed in correspondence on, on occasion as awesome. well uh, through Facebook and other things. And, there's a Facebook page that they had created for that USATF uh, there. Um, boy, put me on the spot. I yeah, guess. I did. I totally put you on the spot. I, I was, it was more out of my own curiosity because I, yeah, I, he was, I taught. He was the one that I remember. Yeah, I taught over 30 level ones uh, before I retired tired from that side to do more work here at Gill. Uh, so I just always love the teachers. I mean, it's, it's a, it's hard for teachers and students. You, you remember that it was a, you know, all night, Friday night, all day, Saturday, and a good chunk of Sunday. That is tough. It is really, really tough. Yeah. And so I'm just always in awe of level ones and USTFCA and Altus, all the coaching education it, to get the value out of it. You've really got to be present hundred percent of the time. And that is tough for both teacher and student. Yeah, and of course I, you know, 
I felt like I was right in my element. I was like, mm. can, let's just keep talking about it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't have any problem with the time frame awesome. and how long it was. And Love it. In fact, probably felt a little bit like, hey, let's, we got some more. Let's talk some more. Let's, get in, <laughs> let's dive a little deeper. So, I love it. I love it. So you, you're coaching, you create the Quick Feet Track Club. I love that. Again, just so in awe. When I do these level ones, I'd always, you know, kind of take a survey of the coaches and be like, all right, so how many people are high school coaches? And, you know, so many people would raise their hand. How many college? And then I'd say, how many are summer youth club coaches? And, you know, invariably some people. And I was like, God bless you. You guys are the most patient, unbelievable people because I can't do at all what you do. So love that you started a track club. You're pouring into eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year, you know, it's just, it's quite amazing. Did you, when you got your degree, was that was the next step now? Because because what's amazing to me about the degree is you're also doing this without any guarantee of a return, by the way. There's no, oh, as soon as you get your degree, boom, here's your job. Like yeah, you could have yeah, not yeah. had a job and an opportunity for a while either. Was there an opportunity after you graduated in the teaching sector? Yeah. So I, I think one thing that really helped was the success of my Quick Feet program. We, mm. you know, we, I got the newspapers involved and, you know, different advertising. We went out and did fundraisers and and you know, got community support with this as well. Very cool. Um, and so we were able to build up a, a, a quality name in the community. And um, so when I finished my degree and had my student teaching opportunity, um, again, just another side note on here, while I was in school at SUU and doing, getting my degree, uh, there was an opportunity to be a freshman girls volleyball coach at Snow Canyon High. Now, that's, I mean, I'm a mile away from the school. So it's literally a school that my kids went to and it's right here in our backyard and ideally would be the perfect situation, right? You know, if I'm going to go back to school, get my degree, man, if an opportunity could come here to coach, it's like, it's perfect. I don't have to travel and do a lot of things. It's right there. Well, it was volleyball. And I was, I was like, gonna say, I have not hey, heard volleyball at all in this story yet. No, yeah. yeah well, there's, there's volleyball in this story. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I'm sitting there and I, so I have this flyer, I get it in one of my classes and I'm, I'm thinking about it. I put it inside of my car, my passenger seat, and I'm driving for this hour back and forth each day. And during the whole trip up to, from leaving from home to go to SUU and then go to my classes and then come back, those trips, I'm just thinking, should I do this? Can I do this? I, do I even know anything about volleyball? Like, would they even consider it? Because I'm like, okay, but if I'm going into physical education, I've got to know this stuff. I know the volleyball has changed. The rules and the, the game has changed since the 80s. Right. You know, when you, you scored only on your serve. Right, and there's libero like, time now. Mm -hmm. stuff, or, so, and the way the game was played had was changed. And I'm like, I don't know anything about that. Can I do this? Anyway, so I, I had this personal battle for about three days. For an hour long each way. So two hours a day, I'm just battling myself. Torture. <laughs> torture, absolute torture. And then finally, I'm like, you know what? She pr they probably already filled the position by now. Call up, just see. Well, I called up and on my way, on my way back home and uh, coach answers. And I said, hey, I'm calling about the position and if it's still available. And, she, and she's like, yes, it is. I said, well, I'd love to meet you. She says, can you come down? I said, well, I'm on my way. I'll be there in about 40 minutes. It's about a 45 minute mm -hmm. drive. And so I drive right to the high school and I meet coach Parker and, and, um, and she's like, this is perfect. You're perfect for this. So anyway, so I got hired to be the freshman girls volleyball coach at Snow Canyon high. Now keep in mind, they had actually just come off, uh, four consecutive state championships on that side. So it came from an elite program and coach Parker's amazing. And so I jumped in with both feet. I said, okay, I'm going to learn this like some of these girls are learning this. And so I jumped right in and I did it for eight years. So I did wow. it right through college. That was one thing that, and keep in mind, it was a stipend. I was paid a, a small stipend, yeah. right, to do this. And so, but but it allowed me to get into the school and allowed me to talk to administration, to talk to the athletic director, you know what I mean? And get to know teachers and coaches and mm -hmm. athletes. And so I did. And so between the success of the Quick Feet program and the notoriety we were getting from the local newspapers and radio and other things like that, and, and the community support itself, along with now going to the high school, interacting with the students, having a good positive experience there, interacting with the teachers at Snow Canyon, along with the administration there, I built up a rapport with them. 
Hmm. So when it came time to, for me to do my student teaching, I was actually assigned to a different high school. And the oh. principal found out about that and said, no, he contacted SUU and said, I need him over here. So unbeknownst to me, until he told me this, it, you know, they said, oh, hey, your assignment has been changed from one high school to the other. So I went over to that high, I went over to Snow Canyon and, and I did my student teaching and stuff there. Cool. Uh, I graduated midterm. So it was like December-ish, mid-year. So it wasn't like, you know, mm -hmm. there's a job right away. Um, and so anyway, so I did some uh, um, substitute teaching and things like that throughout the spring. Mm -hmm. Most of it was at Snow Canyon. They just put me in a system. And so mm -hmm. I was just there at the school almost daily. And then um, after um, after the school year ended that year, the administrator should call me in. And, and uh, during the summer, while I was doing some training with my Quick Beat program, uh, they uh, they called me in and said, hey, um, you know, well, actually, it was a very, it was a very, uh, un, um, a very low key interview. <laughs> I was, they asked me to come in and interview with them. And so, of course, I was all dressed up and everything, but they were very relaxed. Yeah. Shorts and t-shirts in the summer and flip-flops and things. And yeah. anyway, we just had a, just conversation, kind of like you and I are having right now. Right. And then it became, hey, do you want to see your classroom? <laughs> and so I said, so does that mean you want me to be around longer? And they're like, oh yeah, by the way, we want to hire you. So anyway, so we came, but you know what? I, I've been interviewing with them. Exactly. The time. I've been yeah. interviewing based on the volleyball. Right. And the things that I did there with the, with the program and, and the coaches and athletes and right. the parents. And and uh, and then of course the student teaching stuff is. So Anyway, they created a position for me. I, I can't speak enough to, to to Warren Brooks, the principal at Snow Canyon at that time. Um, he made it happen for me. Without mm. without him, I would not be at Snow Canyon. I don't know where I'd be. Mm. Um, so he he made it work and uh, got me in. And and then you know, kind of, yeah, as you can say, the rest is the history. A little bit, you know, we started building up a program, and then they asked me to take over that program. Uh, and um, but I was still doing volleyball. Too. So I, I want to lean into this volleyball thing real quick, though. Okay. This, this is fascinating because in track, we need more track coaches. And so quite often, uh, I'm sure you had to deal with this in the track club. I, I, I would not be surprised if you did. And I've certainly seen this in high school level where we have to uh, train coaches. We have to mom or dad wants to help. And so you have to help them learn how to coach track and field. And especially if they've never done it before, it's hard. Hey, go coach long jumpers. I don't know. Jump as far as you can. I don't know. But, and we know, you know, you, you know, now being an experienced coach, there's a lot more to coaching a long jumper than just as, Hey, run fast. And when you get to that spot, pot spot, just jump farther. Right. So here is, and you hear that quite often with track and field, but I don't know that I've ever heard this in another sport. And I'm quite a volleyball fan. So I learned volleyball in college. I dated a volleyball player. And so I really became a fan. And here uh, here at Gill, our other side of our company is Porter Athletics, which is a huge volleyball company. We make a lot of volleyball standards and things like that. So I'm, I am I love volleyball, man. We, we are in it here. Yeah. So you had no volleyball experience. You knew of volleyball, but the rules had changed. And what he's talking about is it was right when I was in, at Troy. So around 99, 2000 in that area, they went from, you know, the very traditional classic volleyball where when you serve, if you, you know, won that point, you got a point. But if you, if the other team was serving and you won that point, you didn't get a point. So right. it took forever, by the way, it was a yes. very confusing system. Yes. And they went to a more uh, um, uh, attacking type score where every point is, is up for grabs for that team. And they went to a libero situation. Changed it a lot, but it's amazing. It's a great, great, fantastic sport. We live here in Champaign, Illinois, where the University of Illinois is, and we have one of the, you know a traditionally top 10, 15 women's program here every year. It's awesome. Yes. You go into not only coaching volleyball, but you coach freshmen, which I don't know, that might actually have been an advantage. Although with track- I was scared to death. With, with volleyball clubs, though, you might've had some kids that still had some pretty good experience. But what I'm the, the other part that was really fascinating to me is you mentioned, I think, did you say the uh, volleyball coach's name was Coach Parker? Yes. Coach Parker seems very fluent in this. Won three, four state titles. And uh, Coach Parker, male or female? I want to make sure I don't say uh, this. She's female. Yeah. So she said to you, 
oh, you, you're perfect. Which that I was like, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. She knows what she's doing. And she says, this guy who knows nothing is perfect. How did you, you know, coaching volleyball is not like, if you want to make fun of track and say, oh, it's easy to coach track, just tell them to run and turn left. Volleyball yeah. is not throw the ball out and say, hey, get it over the net. Uh, there, right. there is skill. There is technique. There are drills. There's plays. That's what I love the most about volleyball. There's cool plays. How did you even begin to learn what to do to coach volleyball? So I remember Coach Parker telling me that she, why she loved an opportunity to work with me yeah, yeah. was, I, she said, the number one goal is I want you to ha- them to have fun. Mm. Make sure that they're having fun every day, that every day they walk out of the gym, that, that they've had a positive experience. Hmm. And I felt comfortable along those lines. Because I felt like, okay, I can build others. Yeah. Okay. Uh, even if they've struggled all day long, and even if they have a poor attitude all day long, somehow, some way, I'm going to help make that young lady feel good about herself and about her situation when she walks out that gym. And so the first priority was to help them have fun. Love it. Okay. And then to learn the skills. She goes, I don't care if they ever win a match or a game. I want them to learn how to play volleyball. And learn the skills that are doing it. Now, obviously, I had to learn. I was going to say, you don't know that. <laughs> teach those skills and do those skills. So, again, going back to my young days where I felt like I was an observant person uh-huh. who could pick up on things. So, when my practice was over, guess where I immediately went? I immediately went to her practice uh-huh. and watched and listened. I listened to what she was saying to the girls. I listened to, uh-huh. you know, the interaction that her and her assistant head coach would have with the young ladies. I would ask questions to them after the practice. Hey, you talked to this girl about this. What do you mean? What do you, what are you trying to convey? So then I would take that into the volleyball with the freshman girls and sophomore girls and things like that. Um, And so I became a student. Hmm. I became an absolute student of the, of the sport and I dove right in and I'm like, Hey, we're not in track season right now. We're in fall. We're in volleyball season. We're doing nothing but volleyball, and so I I, I dove in and hmm. and learned it. And for eight years, I was a part of that program. And, wow. and and when she stepped down, just to let you know, over a ten year period, she won six state championships, had three second place finishes, and one third. She was in state finals. In Holy nine cow! Amazing coach, amazing um, uh, you know, uh, amazing staff that she put together. And of course, incredible athletes. And, and, uh, she, I learned some great wow. skills coaching from her and, uh, to even apply, uh, into what, what mm. I'm doing on track and stuff. And so, um, uh, so huge, huge thanks. And as far as a mentor, as a coaching mentor, she did a great job in, in doing that and helping me, uh, and, and again, was patient with me asking these questions and, and trying to dive into not only that sport from a technical standpoint, but mm. also from an emotional standpoint, a mental standpoint, especially coaching young, young ladies uh, in those teenage years and, uh, and some of the struggles that they have. Yeah, for sure. I, I love that we didn't lose you to volleyball and you're not like on the Porter okay. Athletic Connections podcast, man. I love that. Uh, you know, I, again, being such a nerd of the coaching education for track and field, I feel like we have a really good culture in our sport for coaching education. You know, there's a lot of great uh, organizations that are doing amazing coaching education. Did you find that with volleyball at all? Was there a, a level one course you went to and a level two? Was, was there anything like well, that for so she volleyball? Got, so yeah, she's well-versed in the gold medal squared. Uh, I think that's what they still call it. Um, and that training philosophy there. And so she gave me the necessary um, paperwork, so to speak, you know, uh, training uh, how to do it and, hmm. and things of that nature. Um, and so I, I didn't actually go to any specific clinics with okay. her, especially at that freshman level hmm. and, 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 so, and even sophomore level as I was doing this. Um, but she actually is an instructor. Hmm. So she goes around still to this day. So she's, she's no longer a head coach and retired from the sport. And, and uh, uh, her two daughters that played went to division one and played at an elite level. Wow. Um, if I remember right, one of them uh, that went to be, ended up at BYU played in the national championship game that they ended up losing to, but w- went to that level. She was a libero there for that. Yeah. 
Uh, the other one went to New Mexico State initially and then ended up at uh, transferred to St. Mary's University there on uh, the West Coast Conference and yeah. uh, was an amazing player wow. for them in you know, different positions. Anyway, um, she had a, a special needs son that, that she, after she coached her girls and focused on him and his life and what time he had left with mm. them. And, and so... Uh, so she stopped as far as the head coaching, but she's been still traveling the country and coaching throughout the years. And so she's she's an elite coach. Phenomenal. Uh, and so to be under her tutelage, even though I didn't necessarily go have any specific training, I, I got it on a daily basis with her. That, uh, that's quite an amazing story, this volleyball side, because especially knowing what she was, what Coach Parker was for the program and the state titles and runner. I mean, if you'd have told me, it was like, oh yeah, you know, we didn't really take volleyball that serious. So, you know, me being the vol- the freshman coach, big deal. We weren't doing anything anyway, but to have this coach who obviously knew what she was doing, taught it to others for crying out loud and was like, yeah, yeah, you're, you're perfect. Cause it seemed like goal number one was, Hey, they got to have a good experience here. They got to have fun. Yeah. And you don't need to know the X's and O's for that. Yeah. It, I don't care how good, you know, the X's and O's. If you don't know that you're, you're not going to be very good in my system is what it feels like she was saying. I can right. teach you the X's and O's. So that's, that's fascinating to me. I love that. That's, that's really interesting, but no one is here to learn more about volleyball. We're here to learn more about track and field <laughs> yes. coaches. So get us back into coaching. You eventually take over. If I heard you right, the track and field program there at Snow Canyon. Yeah. So, so um, once I was hired as a teacher, uh, there at Snow Canyon, um, I was, of course, coaching volleyball in the fall, and then in the spring, uh, I was coaching track as an assistant coach, and they mm-hmm. had me coaching the sprinters and relay teams and uh, sprinters and kind of jumpers and things like that. So I was uh, focusing on on them. Oh, sorry, I'm losing my screen here. Okay, um, and so I was just an assistant coach and oh, okay hold, hold on see hold on you said something there and i am on a tirade for this my what my wife just got this for the first time you just said i was just an assistant coach so i am on a tirade to get rid of just and yes. only in our vocabularies Amen. you were not just an assistant coach my friend right, right. you were an assistant coach I thank yes. goodness right. you were an assistant coach i'm sure that head coach was very very pleased to have you as an assistant coach and i bet you were very pleased to be an assistant coach you were not just an assistant yes. coach my friend all right we got to yes. work on that all right. right thank you for correcting me on that and, and i'm I, on a crusade crusade yeah. for that okay well you I, are... i'm going to jump on your crusade and I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen at our school. Whatever. There we go. I will, I will stop. It demeans it. It demeans it. And it, it is does. something to be uplifted, not demeaned. Okay. Amen. You're an assistant coach. Let's go. So I'm an assistant coach coaching sprints, hurdles, the jumps, uh, relays. Um, and I do that for that year. The head coach at the time, uh, he's our head. He was our, uh, our football coach. He was the uh, defensive coordinator. He was just promoted uh, shortly thereafter to be the head coach. So... He's like, hey, this is your gig. You know this better than I do. So why don't you take over the head coaching position? Wow. And I'll go do the football. It track is in good hands now. They've got somebody, this is all his words. We've got somebody who knows what they're doing, is passionate about it. Like, let me step aside. You do your thing. Yeah. Of course, you know, really had to come down to administration to make the that call ultimately, but that's what happened. Wow. And so at that point, I was then um, uh, appointed to be the head coach uh, uh, for Snow Canyon High School. What's the state of the program? Are we uh, do we have high attendance, high roster, low roster? Uh, do we have a tradition of always going to state with many, many athletes every year? What's kind of the status when you're first taken over here? Um, the status was majority of our height of the track team was our cross country team. Mm-hmm. Okay. Very yep. few kids that were not on the cross country team. Um, the program was in this, is was struggling. It mm-hmm. was in our region. Um, we were right there at the last at the bottom. Mm-hmm. I mean, okay. if we were not at the bottom. We might have been up one position. State, we would maybe get a handful of kids qualified for state each year. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a struggle. Mm-hmm. And um, we 
I knew when I was asked to do this, I remember coming home to my wife and saying, my quick beat athletes, my 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 year olds were faster than my high school athletes. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was taking a huge step back as far as performance goes, mm -hmm. but there was a good culture there from acceptance and participation of athletes. I think the athletes that were there in the program did feel welcomed, felt cared for, um, but there was something lacking. Mm -hmm. And there was a, there was, and, I, and let me give you an example. Our athletes say in the, in the mile or, or 800 meters the race would start gun would go off and immediately our athletes would go right to the back. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally they would like looking for their spot in the back and they would go through the race and then kind of have a massive kick at the last 150 meters, hundred meters, pass a few kids, finish 18th out of 25 or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And the mentality was, well, we're just happy to be here. Mm -hmm. We're not good. We can't compete with these other programs in our region and certainly the state. And, you know, I, we're just going to have fun and we're going to focus on, you know, where we're going to go get a treat. <laughs> and that's kind of where it was. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and again, nothing against anyone or, or anything. It's just that was what was created. And I think yep. a lot of it, even the kids created themselves because sure. when they would see one of our athletes have this big kick at the end. They would go and praise this kick mm. and they would reinforce actually the wrong thing that the athlete was doing. Right. But the athlete didn't know they were doing the wrong thing. They were mm -hmm. just doing what they thought was right. And right. maybe, you know, just what they ex expected it was supposed to go, that they mm -hmm. weren't very good, that these other teams were good and that they just couldn't compete with them. Cause I heard people say it all the time. That we're just not good like they are. Mm -hmm. And, and when I, when I finally had to kind of start trying to the culture that needed to be changed. And that was the biggest thing was changing this culture and this mindset of who we were. Hmm. And so that first year, because knowing from an assistant, from an assistant coach, what was going on in the program and what they were thinking and feeling and believing, I knew what we had to change right away. And so my first year, we created the saying of we're champions training. And that's on our back of our shirts. It's been on the back of our shirts from day one. Hmm. And we were, there was nothing to champion about us. We didn't even have individual champions, mm -hmm. let alone from a state level or a region level, or, or, you know, even getting, being a school record holder, even getting to be in the top of the school at some point. And our mindset certainly wasn't there. I mean, our mindset was very defeated. And so I remember a few coaches kind of giving me a hard time the next year when we first took over and they see on the back of our shirts, we're champions train. And they're like, so how's that working out for you so far? You know, and, <laughs> and, uh, when's the last time Snow Canyon won anything? And, and so, and they were, they were in jest jabs. I, I didn't take them personally, yeah. but, but they knew the state of our program mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't that. And I remember talking to my wife uh, about it and going, this is pretty bold to say this, but I said, I need these kids to start believing that they are better than they think they are. Mm -hmm. And I need them to start thinking about how champions train, how champions act, how champions deal with their, their academics, how champions deal with their parents, how champions deal with their teammates, how champions deal with coaches, how, cha how champions deal with everything in their mm -hmm. life. And so that was the big gist of our program, changing the culture and the belief of it. And we haven't changed from that motto and that saying. I don't know what's harder because both, I think both of these situations I'm going to describe to you are extremely hard. Taking a team like you're describing here, uh, I'm hearing lack of confidence. Um, I'm hearing settling. Like when you talked about, you know, they look for their place in the back. It's like, oh yeah, that's where we belong. You know, air quotes, that's where we belong. You know, not, mm -hmm. not having belief uh, in themselves and in race structure and things like that. So taking them from there to the top or you know, you have some programs that are stuck right at like say third place, which is nothing wrong with third, but you know, if we want to win, 
So you just need a little, a 10 percenter add on to get to the, so I'm not sure which one's harder. How did you, 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 I almost said you gave an example. You, you really didn't. I understand you put champions train here that, but you can't just do that. And all right, we started winning. We put that on the back right. of our shirts and we started winning. So that that's part of the culture. That's a, yeah, I always like, you know, you hear the proverbial, um, uh, puzzle piece, right? And you think of a, of a puzzle and you slide one little piece in. I, I actually think that is true. However, my my puzzle that I always picture is a little different. Not every piece is the same size, right? So like that shirt certainly was a puzzle piece, but it was definitely smaller than belief and trust and training. Those were bigger puzzle pieces in there. So what did you do? Help us understand what are some things that you and the staff and support staff, you know, parents, et cetera. What did you do to change that mindset? Because the training's not changing all that much. You, you were on staff. This isn't a whole new staff thing going on here. Uh, this certainly isn't, uh, and I don't mean this in a bad way because I'm, I'm a fan. This isn't University of Colorado and Coach Deion Sanders, 70 new players. Like, okay, these people had bad culture. So I cut them and I brought in my own to have a good culture. You're not doing that. This is high school track and field. Right. Why are you doing that? What did you do? What were some of the mindsets, training, what, what did you do to change this? We're talking about 14, 18 year old kids. These are tough, tough kids. I mean, tough okay. being tough to change their minds sometimes. Yeah. So, okay. So a lot of things. And, and, and I, and I'm glad you asked this question because this foundation that needs to be created started with, as soon as I was asked to take over the program, I went to what is one of my assistant main assistant coach and coach Thompson, amazing man. I went to his house and I said, okay, it's time for us to get involved really close together. I said, they've asked me to take over the program. I need you. And I need what you're going to bring. I need you to take over the sprints and and jump, uh, long jumping specifically. We don't do triple jump here in Utah, mm -hmm. but I need you to take over the sprints and, and jumping and our just general general training, weight room training, adding this element to, to mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the training program that was not part of our program uh, in the past. Okay. Um, and so I started putting pieces in now, how did I meet coach Thompson? I met him because I was training his, one of his sons through quick feet and through interactions with him. I realized, Oh, he's got this personal training, personal, uh, you know, training background, weight training background, some of this stuff. Uh, and then he was going back and doing some schooling. And anyway, we hit it off. Mm -hmm. Coach James Thompson and I, we just, we hit it off our, 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 philosophies were similar uh what our goals were were similar um and he allowed me to get him in place this part of our program in place so that i can go start working on the other ones because i keep in mind that was my forte as coaching was the sprinting jumping mm -hmm, throwing. that mm -hmm. was also my forte with this so i'm asking i'm now stepping aside from what is my kind of main thing and getting him involved in that and stuff. And so I had to trust him, right? You have to trust that you're a coach shop. Not only did I trust, but then I had to not micromanage him either. I had to allow him to bring his skill set and knowledge and experience with that. Now, keep in mind, a lot of that came from what he saw and observed what we I was doing mm -hmm. with, with the youth. Uh, we did go to a couple of clinics, you know, uh, a couple of glazier clinics and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I got him to go with me to these so that we could hear these things and then of course talk about it and you know not only on the traveling to and from it but the hotel and like we were just all in right? all in in this pro in this process so he has been i mean he he should be getting this award along with me and other i mean he he is amazing and i can't speak highly enough of, of what the impact he's been hmm. for me and our program in helping us establish this culture hmm. uh, with this and uh, it's incredible and so we started with that and and then of course the technical side so the kids needed to know that hey we weren't just talking the talk we were walking the walk as coaches and, and what i mean by that is first day of taking over the practice we went through our warmups and the details of our warmups. And then we explained the why behind every single one of these warmups, mm -hmm. what we were doing, what the goal was of accomplishing it. Well, when we got done with, with the warmup time, I had my top athlete come up to me and say, Hey, that was a great workout. Thanks so much, man. That was amazing. And I said, workout. 
<laughs> practice. Like that was the warm ups. We haven't even started practice. <laughs> we're like 30 to 40 minutes into this and we're still in the technical side of what we need to do. And his eyes were like, oh my gosh, like you're, this is now way different than what we were doing before. They were in and out of there in less than an hour. Before. Mm -hmm. And, and not that we need to go two or three, you know, longer, but we had to, ch this was part of that changing. Mm -hmm. So once we helped the athletes and understand the why behind what we were doing, and then we would go through the drills and other things that they needed to go through, whether it was some speed endurance stuff and they're pushing their bodies to levels and, you know, anaerobic thresholds and stuff that where they're just, you know, having an out of body experience in, yeah. their, in their training, you know, to understand that, Hey, they can push through this and they can do harder things. And, and, mm. you know, let's do this. Okay. Get up, let's get some active recovery in and, come on, you know, you got this, let's get one more. We got one more to get. And so, you know, they knew that we weren't giving up on that. They knew that we were going to be there. We're going to give them everything they got. And so when we're talking to them about the effort that we're giving to them, they've asked for this. They've wanted to have coaches that were engaged with it. I said, we're going to think differently than what we thought before. We're not going to settle for things. We're not going to just assume that other people are better than us. I also told them these other teams are not going to be like, oh, hey, we're going to slow down so that you can, you know, have a top three finish. And right. you know, no, they're not. For us to catch them, we've got to, we've got to train differently. And we've got to do things differently. And we've got to raise our bar and level stuff. And, you know, not everyone obviously buys into that. And so I had some students, some athletes, and even some of our top ones, juniors and seniors that were like, hey, this is, this hmm. is too much. I, I don't know if I can do this. And even some just kind of even walk away. But I told Coach Thompson, I said, look, we've got to change the culture. And if we have to start with freshmen, then we're going to start with freshmen. And we're going to change this culture right through. So let's go with who the which kids are going to be bought in, that are excited, that are willing. I don't care if they ever make a varsity spot or not, but if they're going to show up every day and they're going to give us the effort that we need, and we're going to continue to give the effort that we that they did that they need and they deserve then we're going to change this culture. And so it started with those things. It started with me going out and getting other coaches in those other events. Um, and all of a sudden we started having a full program. Now, now a kid can't come to me and say, Hey, uh, I'm over here at the discus and nobody's coaching me or I don't know what I'm doing. Hmm. Or research. Well, guess what? I have a discus coach that just coaches disc. I have a shot put coach that just coaches shot. I have a javelin coach that just coaches javelin. So my athletes now, through creating the program, have now individual coaches. I don't know of a coaching staff in the state of Utah, right. a lot of, even throughout the nation, even at the college level, that has a coach. I have two high jump coaches. Hmm. I have a long jump coach. I have, you know, a, a hurdle coach. You know, we have, I have distance coaches, two distance coaches, you know? And then hmm. I'm at the point now where, I'm the head coach. I don't even have a necessary specific role mm -hmm. other than I'm doing relays. Coach Thompson okay. say, Hey, you, you love the relays. You're good at it. <laughs> you know what? You take care of the relays. Plus it allowed him to get out early <laughs> and I could stay a little later with the athletes, but you know what? And that's, but that's part of that networking and good yeah. culture that we've created in doing this. And, and, and I, and I still am involved, but, but I'm going around and I'm, and I'm, and I'm overseeing the whole program. Yeah all the coaches and all the athletes, every athlete sees me every day. And they know that I'm, I'm there watching them train mm -hmm. and watching them practice. And I'm even pulling them off to the side or, and I'm even watching other things that they may be struggling with mentally, emotionally, that maybe my coach that's coaching that at a specific event is working on the, so to speak, X's and O's right. the technical side of it. And is missing mm -hmm. some other stuff. And so I'm able now to go see, what those kids really need mm -hmm. more than the technical side of things. Now, Mr. Realtor, you know, we don't build a house all in one could chunk, right? It's the proverbial brick by brick by brick. Yeah. yeah. What was the first indication that things were going upwards? What was the first brick that you're like, Oh, wait a minute. That we've never done that before. That's never happened. Uh, I think we're going to be okay, boys and girls. We're, we're moving forward. Do you, do you remember well, there's a couple of things. First of all, it happened one with one of my, one athlete in particular. He's a middle distance runner for us. Um, great kid, well-respected by the peers. 
uh, for all intents and purposes, the number one athlete on our team. And, but he was a perfect example of what I was talking about. He'd get in an 800 meter race or a mile mm -hmm. and he'd immediately jump to the back and have this massive kick mm -hmm. at the end. And I mean, he'd pass, but he'd run a, he'd run a 207, 208, 209. Mm -hmm. yeah. He would run, a, you know, a 450, 440, 447 mm -hmm. to 452, somewhere in there. But it was like clockwork. And it was the same race every time. He'd finish the race and he's bouncing around at the finish line. Kids are dying at, you know, 428s and whatever. And, you know, you know, they're expense and, you know, they're struggling just to stand up. And he's just bouncing around. And I'm just, I got to the point, I'm like, okay, I, I, this has got to stop. And these kids were, again, his teammates were coming up, hey, that was a great kick and all these things. And I'm like, he ran the race wrong. Right. And so anyway, so I finally said, <laughs> okay. And this was, this was before I was a head coach. This mm -hmm. was when I was the assistant coach. And I told uh, the head coach, I asked him, I said, hey, I know I'm asking a lot right now, but I need your support. I'm going to take this kid from the distance program and I'm going to put him in my middle distance hmm. and do 400 meter work with an 800 meter work. I need to get in this kid's head. I need to, he needs to change the way he's training, the way he's racing, the way he's believing about his ability. Cause he'd make comments like, well, those guys are just really good. They're just, they're just on another level. I'm not, I'm not there yet. <laughs> and it was always that but like i said he's bouncing around the finish line like i've got so much more in me and i'm like that's not the way the 800 feels you should not be <laughs> bouncing around at the end of the race <laughs> and so anyway um so i we, we took him and the coach supported it and we went with it and i said to myself and i said to the head coach at the time i said if, I, if this kid will trust us if this kid will believe in what we're going to do then it's going to go a long way these other kids are going to see it they're going to dive into it they're going to say hey mm. we can have this experience of track and field as a team but we can also be really successful at it mm. so we can have our cake and eat it too mm. right we can have this fun environment we like to be around each other we like to travel together we like to do things but man we can also be really good and so i i was like i need this kid this kid has got to be the one that's going to help change this program and so i took him and i got in his head i I didn't let him get through anything. I mean, I didn't let him slide by anything. I kept him right on recovery periods and right, I mean, with exactness. And a week later, I, I told him, I said, first of all, this next race, you're in the top three after the first lap. I said, if you're not in the top three, I'm going to stand right here. And I showed him where I was going to stand on the track. And I said, I'm going to yank you off this track. I'm going to jump on the track. I'm going to disqualify you and the team. I said, I may not disqualify the whole team. I don't care, but I'm going to take you off the track if you're not in the top three on the first lap. And I looked at him with dead serious in my eyes. I mean, I made it look like, I, you know what I mean? Like all hell was going to break loose. I was willing to go to that extreme. And right before the race, I told him, you know, I, I came to where that spot was. I told him, I said, see, I'm right here, top three. And I think he ran with a little fear in him a little bit. Sure. But he, he went through and he came through and he was right there, top three. Comes through, working that third 200, gets to that 600 meter mark. Now he's in second place. And he's just, he and the lead guy, and keep in mind, this guy's the defending state champ for our classification. And he's on him. And they're come off the turn that final 100 meters and they're just going. Now this kid pulls away from him. He finishes that race and he goes under city subs too. Yeah. It was like 158. He had week before his 209. And he goes 158. And is now number two in our school history. <laughs> and he comes across, he's collapsed. No bouncing around. Yeah. He literally <laughs> collapsed across the finish line. And he's looking up and his eyes are all big. And he's breathing, you know, just breathing. And he's just trying to figure out where he's at. He's delusional a little bit. And I remember going over to him and leaning over to him. And, and I was like, you did it. You did exactly what I needed you to do. Great job. Look at what you did. And I said, you're welcome. And I walked off and I just left him there. <laughs> and I just, and then later on, you know, we got him up and things, but I just, and then we started talking and he's like, coach, I never knew I had it in me. Mm -hmm. And so that was the change of everything. So that was, that was the start. Okay. So that's one kid. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously a lot of our younger kids saw this and they mm -hmm. were like, gosh, like, holy cow. And then they saw him excited and grateful and like, oh man, now what can I do? Maybe I can go place this state and medal. And you know what I mean? Now all of a sudden this world opens yeah. up of what he could do. And so that's what I needed. 
I needed sure. those kids to see what could happen if we changed a mindset, if we changed a philosophy, if we changed a belief. We, yeah, we did change a little training. But those other things had to happen before the training would ever. Right. If, if he didn't do those other things and, and trust me and trust what we're trying to do, right. then, then none of it would have happened. So all of a sudden now, he's believing we're champions training, right? So now that starts this cultural change hmm. that we started with. Uh, it took some time. I remember coming home being very frustrated, uh, going, they're not believing me. They're not trusting me. Like I remember walking in the hallways and the soccer girls were would see me and stop and walk the other way because they knew that I would say something to them, whether it was just even, hey, have a great day. It's good to see you. Oh, hey, when's your next soccer game? I, nothing about recruiting for track and field. Oh, okay. but, they were, but they knew that I'd already talked with them about it. I encouraged them on it. I mean, track and field was like the worst thing to say. to mm. I mean, they started club rugby and everyone was going there. Nobody was going to track and field. And so I remember thinking, I'm just wasting my time. Hmm. All this effort, blood, sweat, and tears that you're putting into it, and it's not going anywhere. And so for a couple of years, we just had where a few kids were buying into it, a few more were buying into it. But, you know, I was getting impatient now. Now it's like, okay, you guys, I, we've proven ourselves as a coaching staff that we're going to provide the avenue for your success. And we're, we're getting frustrated that we're not getting more kids. To mm -hmm. So I remember coming home thinking, I, is this worth it? It might even, might just mm -hmm. waste too much time. And there was a few struggles there, mm -hmm. you know, for, for, for me, is it worth it? And, you know, should I just do the club stuff? I've got a lot better rapport there. Of course, a lot of, my parents and athletes from other schools, rival high schools now are still asking me to train their kids right. because, you know, all those kids were initially going to another school and they were winning state championships and they were winning state individual state championships and team championships. Hmm. And here I am watching my athletes on the club side for six months of the year, go and destroy my kids. On my right. team. And so anyway, so it was a little frustrating. I was like, ah, can't you guys see that we can provide what you need if you'll just come and, so anyway, so COVID year, ironically, that year, we really felt like we were going to put our, our foot down at a state level and mm. say, you better watch out for us because we're coming. And I felt like we finally had the athletes um, in multiple events and the depth to run multiple relays and the depth to, to do those things where before it was like, you know, you just have a handful of kids that try to do everything and mm -hmm. just pray that they could get through it and not hurt themselves, right? And then you question, or am I putting them in a situation where they are going to get hurt right. or defeated or whatever? So we finally felt like, hey, we're creating depth, we're creating an environment and, and that, you know, we've got a good momentum going and then COVID hit. And we actually were able to get our invitation in. And that, oh, weekend, wow. that weekend. And uh, we had athletes from all over the state and even out of the country, or, uh, you know, across the states wow. calling me because we were, we were still going. Mm. Our district made that call. It wasn't that I made that call. Mm -hmm. I, I, we were subject to whatever they were. Mm -hmm. doing. They said, you know what, we're going to do this. So it was literally, you know, COVID came out on that, like that Wednesday when Utah Jazz. Mm -hmm. So, and then we were Friday and Saturday. Wow. And, so we were like, what are we, what, what's going to happen? And they said, at this point, we're going to keep conducting things. And, and so anyway, so we ended up having our meet, great performances by our kids and really started stepping the bar. I think my couple of my milers went 415 and, you know, just really fast and really good. Wow. You know, 154s and 153s and stuff. So we, and then we had sprinters doing good things anyway. So we had a good meet, but we also had, it was like our state meet. I mean, mm. we had athletes, top athletes coming in, uh, uh, Thomas Boyd and, uh, he's running for Stanford right now. He broke the state record and ran a 404, 1600 <laughs> at the time. And so anyway, so yeah, I mean, we and went 8, 50, 849 in the 32. So anyway, so we had some great performances. And, and, and again, that was part of building this whole culture too with mm -hmm. our invitational. Our invitational went from a few local teams to, it's huge. I mean, mm -hmm. I had 60 plus teams coming. It's yeah. Miles Split was coming and doing things live. And we were, you know, creating a fun and good atmosphere, and you know, for this meet, and and uh, again, showing the kids, look, we're in, we're going all in, and if you're going to be a part of this program, you want to be a part of this program, then the 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 level of 
you know, uh, expectations are higher. Mm -hmm. Are all the way around. And so anyway, so that was hard because I felt like, dang, we finally are getting to this point where we're mm -hmm. going to get ourselves on a state stage where we're not just a few athletes here or there, but right. the depth of athletes are performing at a high level. And to have that taken out, that was hard. That was a really hard one. And I, obviously for the athletes, I mean, I remember getting a text at three in the morning from one of my athletes, just like, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know. And, and I mean, and how do you respond as a coach? Right. None of us, even in the coaching degree, I, I didn't, there was nothing in there that says, this is what you do in a pandemic. Right. <laughs> right. And this is how you handle athletes. And this is what you should say to them. And this is what you do. And so we were all learning during this process, but um, that was hard. I felt like, oh man, we just run this verge of really taking our program to the next level. And, and I initially my you know, I felt like the rug was pulled out, hmm. but ironically, it just was what we needed. I mean, in a way, the, it, there was enough momentum built at that point that when we came back that next year and we were able to go and do things like they responded, the kids responded. Wow. And all of a sudden now track and field was a thing that was talked about and kids were talking to each other and encouraging each other and football coaches were supporting it and doing other things. And so <laughs> anyway, and so they were backing things up and, and soccer. Co I mean, like I said, I started having the full support of other coaches from our, Mm -hmm. our teams and, and fall volleyball and basketball and other things and so all of a sudden some things started happening and mm -hmm. kids started coming and all of a sudden they had success mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they you know this whole snowball right they wanted more success and then then other kids are like hey what are you talking about what's going on oh this is going on hey well maybe i should try it and and so again once the foundation was laid the culture was created the coaches were put in place. We allowed them to do the things that they needed to do to be successful. And we supported them financially from the things that they needed. We fundraised. We did all the things. We, we said, hey, we're going to be a new program. We're going to change everything about it. We got new equipment. We got new things. And you know what I mean? Like everything. I just was, I was like saying, hey, you've got everything you need to be successful. These other programs haven't been doing this. Look at their stuff. Look at ours. Like we're like we're putting our money where our mouth is. We're saying that we're we're this. We're saying we're this is where championship. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We're gonna do this. And and we were all in. My coaching staff and everyone. We just were all in. We started getting parents more involved. And you know, just there's a lot of work, right? I mean, all of these things require this enormous amount of work behind the scenes mm -hmm. that nobody sees until mm -hmm. your team shows up and they're like, "Wow, who's this team?" And they're really good. And that's kind of what happened. I think we caught the world by storm. We just built it up and all of a sudden things just happened and these kids started trusting us and believing us. These guys are coming in. I mean, we're talking top athletes in our school and they're coming in and they're they're giving me and my other coaching staff their undivided attention. They are, they are not um, trying to get out of things. They're not trying to mm -hmm. shortcut things. They're like, hey, what do I need to do to be better? <laughs> and not only in this sport, but how's this going to help me in my other sports? And when they started seeing that correlation on their football performances or soccer performances or basketball, like all of a sudden they're like, holy cow, I need this in my main sport. And then some of them started going, I really like this. I, I think I want to pursue this more than what I thought I wanted to pursue. Mm. So then, like I said, it just, it's now the snowball effect where it, it started going and and I'll tell you what, we caught the perfect storm last year. I mean, it just, it was amazing. And, so, and I, give us a little bit of the progression here. You, you mentioned, you know, 20, the rugs pulled out from under you. Uh, so give us, how did that, that snowball that's happening, where, uh, how did the team do 21, 22, and then now this magical year here in 23? So 21, we, um, I would go to state, and this is on the girls' side. We go to state on the girls' side, and I've got 10 girls competing at state, okay? Um, eight of them end up scoring for us in some fashion or other. Nice. Two of those were in just one race in a four-by-eight relay. Hmm. So six girls really scored. We won state with six girls. Oh, wow. I had a girl win the 100 and 200, the four, and we won the four-by-one and four-by-two. I had another girl take one of my real take second. So we won two in the hundred. 
Then we went first, third, and fifth in the 200. Wow. I had a hurdler, took second in the 110s. Um, like I said, we won both of those relays. Um, my four by eight took, I think, fourth or fifth. Wow. Had two middle distance. I had a third and a fifth in the 800 and a third and a fifth in the, in the mile. Wow. Um, no field events. Scored. Yeah. My one field event, my high jumper, she didn't score. She took, I think, 10th. But she was my only field event. Hmm. We won state with those girls. And it just opened up everything. It was a shock to us. We knew we had top end talent hmm. on this team. I mean, they had done it all year long. We just felt like we weren't going to compete with a couple of the other programs in our state because they were bringing 30 plus mm -hmm. athletes and we had 10. Right. And we pulled it off. Hmm. We, a few, I mean, a few kids on these other teams kind of struggled, didn't make a final, mm -hmm. maybe that were expected to make a final, didn't score as high as they were maybe expected to. Again, kind of a little perfect storm. Things happened. Next thing we know, we're going into the 200s. And I got three girls in the finals of the 200. <laughs> and, you know, and every all field events at this point have been scored. Uh, and we have the 200 going and then the four by four. And by the way, we don't even have a four by four team. And so then I go in and they, and I'm looking at, we're looking at the scores and we go first, third and fifth. And then we look at it and go, even if this other school wins the four by four, which I, I they may have, we, we have enough points to beat them. Incredible. And so anyway, so that's where it started. It started with the, from a championship standpoint, that's where it started. Our guys were good. I think we ended up fourth that okay. year. Um, Great performances. We just didn't have enough depth. In fact, ironically, we didn't have any sprinters. My distance hmm. runners and some field events, we were really good with those and scored high, but I had no sprinters. In fact, I don't think our relay teams even made finals. Wow. Uh, you know, so we, our four by four did, but, but when we were good, but we may have scored two or three points on that one. So, so how do you, how do you, how do you build off of a fourth place? in a state championship on the girls' side, how do you build and rebuild going into 22? Well, I think part of it was we did have the areas we had success in, we had really good success. So mm -hmm. my javelin thrower broke the state record Wow! as a sophomore. And he threw 204 feet. Or oh. feet and he wins that event. And, you know, I have shot putter that came in and took second at it. Um, you know, we had uh, my distance runners. You know, we had some good milers and half milers and score high in those. And I put, I think we had three scores in the 800. Wow. My uh, four by eight was good. And, you know, we, we actually still have that 4A still state record because uh, they've only been doing the 4A as a classified event and, and scoring event in Utah over the last like four years, five mm. years. So we actually still hold that record at the 4A level. And, and so, you know what I mean? Like some good things happen. So some really good things at a high level happen on the boys' side. We just didn't have the depth. Mm -hmm. the well, all of a sudden, the next year, we start getting the mm -hmm. start getting some more depth. And the depth that we were training, they were freshmen and sophomores, and they were coming up. We had some great hurdlers. You know, as they were freshmen, they were, you know, just learning and, mm -hmm. learning and going through the freshman woes, but they were competitive and they were, mm -hmm. you know, excited to train and, and get after it, and they'd become elite. And, um, and so anyway, so we, again, this culture was created. They were just jumping in. They just weren't good enough re and ready to go to that next level three years ago. Hmm. But then two years ago in 2022, that's when they realized that, oh my gosh, we're really good. Hmm. And we've got the potential to be really, really good. And, and then again, we started getting athletes in all events and not just right. or middle distance runners or some throwers. We started getting scoring in in a lot of events, and that's what it takes to. Really, mm -hmm. I mean, that the women. I, <laughs> sometimes I look back still and go, "How did we do that? How did we <laughs> score ninety plus points with six girls?" Yeah, and, right. And and they were amazing, and so that just catapulted. It was like, and I think the guys were like, "Well, we want to win." Right. They, they saw how the girls reacted, <laughs> and they saw what it was to be the first ever in Snow Canyon history. Oh wow! To do that in almost thirty years. And they're like, well, we want to, I, I think there was just this like, hey, we're we're going to raise the bar. You know what I mean? Like we're going to do yeah. that. So we jump in. And and then not only that, did they have success in the track and we win state that year. Um, but uh, they started having success at a higher level in their mm. other sports. Mm. And they started getting 
getting more offers and more recognition than these other offers. And ironically, speed and strength and you know some of the things that we're, we're teaching and coaching there on the track side were coming to fruition in those other sports. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you're good and you're big and strong and you're fast and we want you to keep going here and, and this stuff. So, so these kids started getting this attention in their main sport and they're like, wow, this is great. Track's doing great things for me. And I like this. I like feeling good. I like having success. I like getting medals around my neck, stand on, on the podium at a high level. And you know what I mean? And, 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 but the thing is, these kids weren't conceited. It wasn't, I'm better than you. Uh, they, they knew that their success was dependent on who they had next to them in the blocks at right. practice the day before and that day of. So every day when they're coming, they know that everyone's given their, their all. And, and then we started creating this depth. Hmm. And like I said, this last year ended up being this perfect storm. I mean, you know, we had, I think I had five guys in the finals of the 200. I had four guys in the finals of the hundred. Um, and that was ironically, that was without my number one sprinter going from last year. He hurt his hamstring. Oh, and wow. He ended up having to pull out. Like he didn't even end up doing what we thought he was going to do. We didn't end up having him at all in any relays or individual. Huh. He was my top guy from the year before. And so I think where we would have been with, we would have had him on top of these things. And so, you know, my four by one wins, my four by two wins, four by eight wins, um, four by four took second, ironically, but broke our school record. Uh, my hurdlers, you know, now when they were a few years before, they were struggling, you know, as, as freshmen and learning. Now they're, some of the top kids in the nation, my, my one hundred or 300 hurdler, I think he was ranked number 11. Uh, wow. In the nation. He was, you know, run a low 37. 37 wow. Two. Went to Arcadia and uh, ran there and, and uh, took second at huh. Arcadia in the invitational section of Arcadia. Yeah. Uh, he's a senior this year and he's a, you know, multi-state champion in the 300 hurdles and the 110s. And, you know, he's getting a lot of offers and a lot of things now and, He's going to be one of the top juniors in the nation wow. this coming year. And, and, you know, we're hoping that he's going to dip it or go below 36 this year. And, and uh, anyway, his, again, this culture that was created and, and I've got two other hurdlers that are, you know, 38s and, and, and low 39 and, you know, and, and wow. high 37. And so, I mean, we're good. And so you start going through this and then I get a kid who shows up to learn the discus, right? Senior ends up finishing second at state it was 146 or something like that <laughs> but he's learning for the first time it shows again look at my coach that it takes a kid who's never done it before mm-hmm. and does this I have a shot putter you know he has his pr at state wins state throws 49 feet 11 and three quarter inches and his pr <laughs> coming in is like 47 nine you know but my coach just persistent just you're gonna it's gonna you're it's keep coming it's gonna happen it's gonna happen you're gonna pop this and this whole series in fact i had another coach text me during the warm-ups saying this kid's on fire <laughs> this kid's probably gonna win it today and sure enough he goes out there and wins, you know and yet he was not favored to win it. so we just had this perfect storm where kids mentally physically emotionally just everything about it you know, and they supported one another. They were cheering each other on all the way through. I, you know, I, I mean, we had three high jumpers placed in the top six. We won it back, back to back high jump, you know, um, and we had got other guys scoring. My javelin thrower won again. He won three straight years. You know, I mean, like it just, I, I, milers, I had, I had, I had placed three guys on the podium, top six in the mile. Uh, 800 meters, same thing. We scored. We had several scores in that two mile. We had scores. Like I said, we won the four by eight. I mean, it was just, I mean, as a coaching staff, we just sat back. We knew we were good. We knew we were going to be fair to win. We had a, we had a scoring somewhere in the 160 range. The other teams around, you know, the second was about 90 and stuff. We ended up at 214 points. Holy cow. And we just, <laughs> I don't know what to say other than, yeah. It, it just was a perfect storm. We had built up to it and kids were buying in and they bought into the system. They bought into the training. They bought into just everything that was going on and they didn't have grudges over who was faster than this. Like I said, we had all these guys in the finals and they just ran and they celebrated their success with one another. Mm. 
you know, as a coaching staff, we'd look back and go, man, this is amazing. I mean, there was no egos. There was no nothing. There was just, and, and we're putting these relays together. I mean, I, I mean, I had five guys in the finals of the 200. So who's my four guys? Oh, yeah. Kids, right? And I mean, and so I plugged other guys in all season long and stuff. And same thing with my four by one. I mean, the guy who won the 200 meter state champs, he went 21 6, 20 67. He wasn't even on my four by two, four by two relay. <laughs> he was long jumping and running the 100 and still was getting in several. Uh, but you know what I mean? So it just worked. It, it, we just had that that special season where everything kind of came together and and but but we've been building it. We've been building it for years and yeah. And uh it, it just it just all fell into place and, and we just had to step back and stay out of the way. That's I think that's the great lesson there is that you know to build a program of where you are today doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it ha there has to be little things that athlete believing, uh, you know, what I really found fascinating about your athlete that went from the 209 to 150, the guy you were going to yank off the track, you know, we, we see, we tend to talk to ourselves worse than we would talk to someone we don't like. And what I loved about that story was, you know, he, he listens, he comes through in top three, but then he had a, he had another choice to make at that point, that third 200, he easily could have been like, okay, well, I did that. And coach is crazy. Cause now I'm about to die and could have easily falling all the way to the bag. Instead, he was like, okay, well, I'm here. Let's see what else happens and kept pushing. And then obviously it goes, you know, goes sub two, quite amazing. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, but that's like the Genesis story of to building up to where yeah. you are and putting three, uh, you know, five in the finals of the 200 and three high jump. I mean, it's, it's amazing. The brick by brick, the continue building, get a little bit better every year. Good things will happen. People want to be with winners, right? So as you start becoming successful, more people come in, other coaches are coming in to help and give their athletes and encourage their athletes to run track. It's a great story of how to, to build a program. It's always interesting to me for track, you know, when football wins the state championship in high school, you know, they have all year to celebrate, meaning they walk that hallway in February. We won that title back in December, boys. In track, we get done and we go to supper, <laughs> we go home and we don't really get to celebrate. So you, you're on an all time high here. You're winning the state meet by tons and tons of points. It's quite ludicrous to be real frank with you. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you get into the, the lulls of summer, you're doing maybe summer track club. And then at some point, I don't know, I don't know actually how they do it, whether they call you or send you a letter. At some point, someone reaches out and tells you that you are the national, not Utah, which would by golly, that's amazing. If you were the Utah coach of the year, the national boys coach of the year, tell me how that went down. Did you think it was like a prank call from one of your buddies? How had that, how'd that uh, occur? Yeah. It's funny that you say that at the end of school year, we finish up at state. We come home late that night on a Saturday night and we graduate Wednesday. Yeah. So, I mean, seniors were not even there. Right. Nobody. It's, we, we hardly have any kind of celebration. In fact, ironically, we just got our state rings. Hmm. Well, the first one, the first batch that came in today. Because yeah, wow. We got them yesterday and today. And and so here we are. And some of them are gone. Like, they're, I got to get them to their families because they're off to college or off on a right. or whatever. And yeah. so they're not even able to celebrate those. So it's ironic that you say that because, yes, being in the spring, it ends. And we're right at the end. And, you know, to have this performance and stuff. and and. It, and we just sometimes anticlimactic because we can't really celebrate it as much as we were hoping to. Right. To celebrate it. Anyway, so yeah, so we're going through summer and going through the summer things. Cross country started, and we're coaching cross country now, and not volleyball anymore. We're coaching cross country now, and this is starting our fifth year in coaching cross country. And anyway, um, yeah, I, I I I get this call. First of all, I I, I do get the. Uh, email or or whatever saying that uh, been selected to be the the utah coach mm -hmm. of the year. okay okay for boys track and field so i get an email regarding that my my athletic director gets me something mm -hmm. or gets it. anyway so he sends it to me and i'm like wow that's and it's awesome you know, right I, yeah I, I i look at the you, you know the the coaches association and i have a the utmost respect for that coaching association mm -hmm. and people that are part of that and and of course, you know, you know, as a coach, you always have to hope to have more time to be involved in training and, mm -hmm. and learning more from other coaches and your fellow coaches uh, to add to your toolbox of, of things that to help you be mm -hmm. better and uh, and more successful. And and so I've always looked at you know things like that and, and opportunities and 
and, and, and I always respect it. I've read the articles in the past of, of coaches who've got things before, and I'm like, man, that's so cool. You know, that these coaches do a great job, and man, you know, we got to keep going. We got to keep fighting, and we got to keep building things. And and for me, it was always an inspiration, you know, hmm. kind of reading through some of the stuff and never once ever thinking that 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 I would have an opportunity to be recognized on a level of that nature. Uh, so when that call came in, um, I, yeah, I'll be honest, I actually just got out of the shower uh, and it was cleaned up and, and things. And, and so and I normally don't answer a call from an out of state area. Right, right. <laughs> but for whatever reason, I did. And uh, lo and behold, it was uh, Christina there at the, uh, the Coaches Association there and and, uh, and telling me about it. And it's ironic that you talk about the prank call. She's like, this is not a prank call, <laughs> just to let you know. So anyway, because I think she could see and hear in my voice the the utter uh, astonishment and and just humbleness of of uh, of what she was telling me and what she was saying to me and 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 of course through my head I you know I was going through a lot of emotion you know a lot of emotions of you know where we were when I was in that same room talking to my wife about I don't know if I should keep going with this and is right. it worth it uh, to thinking about all of the effort that my coaches have put in and the time and effort that they've put in. Uh, to support me and support the kids because, you know, they, I think that, you know, they, they had to put a, first of all, trust in me to allow them to be a coach and to be a part of our program and to know that I was going to support them instead of them kind of catering to me as the head coach. It was just the opposite. I tried to create an atmosphere of what can I do for you? How can I help you be successful? What are, what are the things that you need? And so I, I hope they have felt the appreciation that I have for the effort that they're given to me and to our athletes on a daily basis. And, and so I, I, I just was thinking about all those coaches meetings and conversations and at the meets and wondering what we need to do and how do we take it to the next level and what, how, do we, how can we help these kids believe and trust in what we're doing and, and the culture that we're creating here. And, and so anyway, so I obviously the flood of emotions just of, of going through all of those things and to think that somebody's recognizing Utah, you know, <laughs> and, and little old St. George, a smaller community in the state of Utah on a national stage, just just um, brought a lot of also pride in our community and support that I've been given, you know, and what we've done from from Quick Fee and, and the USATF uh, to the high school level and and, you know, my principal, Warren Brooks, for hiring me and allowing me to have this opportunity. And, and then my principal Monkers and our, and our other administrators, the support that they've given me, our athletic directors. Uh, you know, you start thinking about all these things. And, and then again, the booster club that we started to help our cross country and track and field programs be able to finance and fund some of the things that we need to do and, and that we're hoping to do. And, um, you know, you just start thinking about all the people that are involved in this process. And you think, why me? Like, mm -hmm. why, why is this happening to me? But, but also grateful that, that all the hard work has been being recognized. Yeah. And so I, I uh, told people, I said, I, I don't take credit for the, the coaching side of it from that. I, I take credit for trying to, to put in the program as it is right now in place, you know, hiring the right coaches to get into the right things and, and getting the other people behind the scenes involved in the success of our program. I, I said, okay, if there's, I'll take credit for that, that I, you know, the day-to-day -day operations, my coaching staff has been absolutely phenomenal. And, 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 you know, and, and, and there's times where I've gone in and helped and given some, they give it, you know, thoughts and advice and, Hey, let's look at this. And, you know, maybe this athlete needs some work here and maybe, you know, let's do a few drills or things to help them and, and do that so I'm, I'm actively engaged in all those things and and uh interacting with my coaches but but also like i said trusting them and they're doing an amazing job and uh i need to just like my coaches are asking my athletes and i'm asking my athletes to trust the process mm. i've got to trust the process too and let my coaches coach and do right. the things that i've asked them to do and so i guess i'll take credit for those things but outside of that i it's truly a coach's a coaching staff award and 
and recognition for the program that we have created together. You know, before we hit record, Justin, you know, I told you, I wish uh, all these coaching of the year awards were coaching staff of the year awards because no head coach does it on their own. However, I do have a lot of respect for the head coach because of what they have to do outside of the X's and O's of the actual coach. Not saying that an assistant coach is only on an X's and O's protocol themselves. They have their own things that they also have to get done, but the head coach has to set the vision. The head coach has to set the tone. The head coach has to pick up the three, four, five, six, seven, however many other assistant coaches that you have out there. You have to support them. It's the, uh, you know, you've seen the triangle with the, you know, the CEO up top and all that. It's actually completely reversed where you're serving the assistant coaches so that they can serve their athletes. Uh, so I have a great respect for it. So I love the recognition of the award of the hard work, uh, the sacrifices. Um, and outside of you, Justin, and your assistant coaches, I have to imagine you correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, family support and sacrifice. Uh, you mentioned some administration support. You mentioned great coaching support from your soccer coach, football coaches, well, your, your rest of your athletic department, teachers who are teaching these kids. I imagine it's, uh, and, and you've been describing this way, it's an entire ecosystem, if you will, to win this National Boys High School Coach of the Year Award. No question. Uh, you know, from, from putting out a little announcement of how we're doing or how certain individuals are doing at school, uh, I, I tried to send for years, I started off, so I wasn't doing what my coach did as far as doing an actual newsletter, but I was doing a synopsis of our meet and, awesome. and, and recognizing athletes at all levels from whether it's per, a personal record that they set or, or whatever, but I would send out kind of these results to our, our, our faculty. And so, and I'm sure there were several times they just went right in and deleted it, didn't even read any of it, but I, but I, I know a lot of them did. And I, I always made sure that they, you know, when you have these students in class, say something to them, mm -hmm. you know, recognize, hey, I read where you had a really good track meet or you had a new personal record or you finished this or qualified for or whatever it was. I tried to make sure, put these out. These are these are building opportunities for you as a teacher in Spanish and in physics and biology and math and whatever for you to help build a report with this student so that they're going to even be more engaged in your class. If you're showing that you respect them and what they're doing in their off time, man, that was going to go a long way in helping build this kid up. Oh. And if this kid is response to you in, in a biology class, well, guess what? The kid next to him is going to be like, what's, what's this kid doing? I've, I've got to do what this kid's. And so right. again, going back to this culture of just trying to create this. And so, yes, from everything that we tried to do in exposing the program and, and advertising the program, talking about the program, um, First of all, I haven't shied away from doing it, but second of all, it's it's we we celebrate the success of everyone, and and then it's all it's come back. You know, we've made the kids the priority. We've made their success a priority at whatever level they're at. I don't care if they're first. You know, if they're running 100 meters and uh, you know if a boy's running 100 meters in 16 seconds, if that's a new record for him, we're going to celebrate it. Right. You know, if it, if a kid's running the mile in eight minutes and 30 seconds and it's a new personal record. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to bring it up in front of the team. And I'm going to talk about the effort that that kid's giving in practice every day to, to improve. So we, it takes time to do that, but I can tell you, you know, obviously I mentioned coach Thompson, you know, and how, what, what, a, you know, right-hand man he has been for me for all this time, but there are so many others. And, um, I, 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 I need to mention a few of them. Uh, Absolutely. I have uh, Coach Martin. He He's now moved to Arizona with his family with another job opportunity and things like that. But he was my distance coach and, and kind of helping build our distance program. And uh, he was one that at the beginning, he and I would kind of stand in the infield and watch the races and watch the what kids interact and how they would perform and kind of what their mindset was. And we talked about how we need to change this culture. And so we started talking about ways that we can do that, that, you know, there in the middle of an infield watching the meet to how we can implement this in practice and what we can do. So he was, he was definitely part of this, helping me change this culture uh, of that. And, uh, and so he did it. He did a great job for many years before we ended up losing him uh, to that. But um, 
So I, so Coach Roberts, Tra uh, Travis Roberts and Allison Renstrom have taken over my distance program and they've done an amazing job. They're helping me on the cross country side of, of things and, and helping this program. And, and uh, they've been instrumental in continuing what we kind of started building with, with the distance program and then changing it uh, to what it is now and putting multiple guys on the, sit on the podium and kids going on to the next level to run and do some things. Um, Coach, uh, Coach Laura Martin has changed our shot putting program and she's done an amazing job. And this last year, she's, she, uh, she's just, she just meshed right in. She's the newest member of our kind of our coaching staff when it came to kind of the ones that have been there. And she just jumped right in and did things. Um, uh, coach Mike McLennan, he's my discus coach. Again, we hadn't scored in the discus in years. I don't know if we've ever scored a point at, in the state wow. at the discus. And he takes a kid, you know, never done it before and does it. And then on the girls' side, we had three podium finishes in the girls out of the discus. And all three of those girls are back this year. And so, you know, he's, he's done an amazing job of teaching that. And, and we had a freshman boy who, ironically, we've actually lost because family moved. But he placed as a freshman. And threw in the 127, 127 to 130, somewhere in there. I can't remember off the top of my head, but he uh, he scored for us as well and placed as a freshman. Um, so, you know, he was taking a kid that was brand new to the sport as a senior and one as a freshman, and he <laughs> podiumed both of them. So amazing job uh, with that. Uh, the Hickman brothers, Matt and Brian Hickman, are my javelin coaches. Um, and uh, we had four guys podium on the javelin this year. And uh, three of them were throwing it for the first time. Wow. And uh, and then I had a female uh, take second and had her personal best at state to finish second. Uh, and I think she's third now in our school history, but you know, she, she was our only javelin thrower on the girl's side. And she peaked at the right time and, <laughs> and, and through that. So the Hickmans have done an amazing job and of our javelin throwers, our hurdlers, uh, I need to shout out to Coach uh, Paige Robinson. She was uh, she was kind of another right hand man of mine. She uh, when she came in to our program, she 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 comes from a heptathlete background, and she just jumped right in and, and helped change again the culture that we were trying to create from a training standpoint, a belief standpoint, a fight, a toughness standpoint. And she helped us do that and did an amazing job uh, while she was with us. We also lost her to a move. But ironically, we have one of our former athletes who's only three years removed. He was part of the COVID year. He was a senior during COVID. And so he has come back learning under Coach Robinson, and he's taken our hurdlers, who are some of the top ones in the nation, and he has yeah. taken them and, and training them. Wow. Still under her guidance, he converses with her, you know, And but as far as the training and the types of training that we're doing and and you know we're working with him as well and but he's done an amazing job as a young coach uh, that can still go over the hurdles and do some things which is always nice um but he's done an amazing job tyler jessup has done an amazing job as a former athlete that's now kind of giving back to the program and, and he's done an amazing job there and, and then i've got a couple other guys that uh have come in and helped us and are really starting to get their feet wet with some things well first of all i need to talk about my high jump coaches i have two of them uh coach andrew jensen who again, we just lost to a move back up oh, to Oregon where he's from originally. His wife just had their baby and their first child and they've moved back home and and uh, anyway, and, and with her work and, and stuff. And so anyway, he did an amazing job. And uh, we were set, such a blessing to have him and his wife uh, down here in our program. And he helped us out with cross country as well. And he's a huge loss for us this coming this year because he's helped in so many aspects. But ironically, and maybe blessing for a definite blessing for us, we had Coach Blake Watkins, who has been helping us with the high jump as well. So they too were working together, mm. and with that, so we're going to have a seamless transition now, and nice him taking over the program, which is which is great. And again, we we high you know we we podiumed one of our only well one of our only girl high jumpers along with with you know three guys, uh, and then just a fourth just missed it. Uh, and uh, so anyway, so we're excited about that program. Uh, we we lost two of those high jumpers to graduation, but the defending state champion jumped six eight and stuff. He's back to defend it for hopefully a third time and stuff. So anyway, um, so we we've had a lot of success with those coaches. And then again, the other two coaches, uh, 
Coach Garrett Quackenbush, he's helped us with the distance side of things. He's also a, a younger guy who's in, in school right now and medical school doing some things here locally. Um, wow. And he's helping us out with that. And then uh, Coach Dre Smith, who's our, our, our defensive coordinator on the football team, he's been helping out Coach Thompson on the sprinting side. And he's going to help be – he's going to take a much more active role in some things this year. He kind of learned this last year because he's been on the football side for so long. But he loves the athletes. He loves the kids. And he's so good with them. And, and so Dre's going to do a great job with us and in helping us expand our sprinting program even more and where Coach Thompson can – can work a little bit more individually with some of the others and he can help develop the younger ones and, and kind of continue our success of the sprinting program that we've created over there at, at Snow Canyon. And so, as you can see, I got a large staff. I've got yeah. for every one of the events. And, um, and so we're really blessed to have that staff and, and, uh, and, and coaches that have coached with us along the way and, and throughout time. And um, I can't thank them enough. You know, I, I, I wish I, like I said, they, they should be traveling with us and doing the things and, and chatting here with you and, and others. And, uh, I, they, are, they are, I told my, I told, I told my athletes, and this is one thing I also learned when I was first started coaching. Cause when I was doing quick feet, it was just me. So mm -hmm. I started, you know, I'd start at six o'clock in the morning with my distance kids. And then I'd have sprinters and stuff come. And anyway, I stayed there the whole time. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon all summer long. And I'd coach all the, all the events and I did it by myself. Hmm. So I was coaching the shot players and the discus and the, the relays and the jumpers and it's taxing and you can't keep it up. And so I learned early on in that coaching my club team that I need to get people around me. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that I need to get the better people around me, better hmm. than me. So as soon as I start getting better people than me around me, then that's a good thing. And mm -hmm. I have a coaching staff filled with better people than me. And, uh, and so we've been able to find a lot of success in that. And, and again, the, you know, the administration boosters and family, uh, I, wow. And I, what can I say to, about my wife? You know, she has, she has been right there with me side by side during this whole transition from real estate to, to going back to school and the, the coaching to, to then head coaching and a lot of time away and away mm -hmm. from our, our family as well as, you know, responsibilities here at home and other things like that. And, but we all, we're a team, you know, as part of it, we're part of the same team. My wife is a piano teacher as well. And she's a music education and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we understand it. So when she has her recitals and she's getting kids for mm -hmm. big performances, I'm supporting her and helping her and going to those and, you know, helping her with the things that she needs, like she's helping me with the things that I need during hosting meets and other things of that nature. And so we have a great team together uh, in making this happen. And you can't have that. You can't have the success that we've been able to have without, again, all these people behind the scenes and, and out there in front, in the front of the scenes, uh, making it, making it happen all the way around. And so I feel truly blessed and honored and grateful for all the people that have been involved in this process with us as we've created this program and team and um, and the support that we've been given uh, again from secretaries at the school to again athletic directors and and uh, uh, the administration I, I can't thank them all enough for the support that they give and um, and uh, it's fun to see them at the meets the big meets and then them coming up going coach you're slaughtering them like you're really good like i didn't realize it's gonna be this bad and you know what i mean and things like that and just and, and just for them to see the passion that we have mm. feel that and to and to recognize it and to, and to, and to celebrate it too i i you know it's, it's been fun to for track and field to be put on a pretty high pedestal at the school now where right like i said it wasn't very long ago that it was the least talked about sport at the school and and almost, almost like it was the worst thing that you could be a part of at the school. And so, um, yeah, I, I never thought we'd get to a level of this. You know, I, I always hoped and dreamed and, and knew that if we stuck to the tasks that we were trying to create, that we could, could create something special. But to know that it kind of did what it did this last couple of years, I, I'll be honest, it's kind of the stuff that dreams are made of and when you, when you go into this and hoping that something like this could ever happen. So I'm reminded 
I'm reminded of the old saying, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, go with others. And that story from your coaching staffs, uh, which, which a lot of uh, turnover in your coaching staff, that, that that surprised me. I mean, to continue, that's that's quite amazing. And, you know, your wife, you, you can't do it without your family support and your family and your uh, administration, teachers. It's quite amazing. You have great tribe there and uh, you continue to pull on the same rope. And I think that's what caused this uh, slaughter, if you will. That's where the points are coming from, that these kids believe in themselves from the coaching staff, know that others believe in them and they're running for that higher purpose. They're running for the team, not just their individual accolades. And I think it showed in the, uh, the great team score. And then of course, uh, many, many accolades as, you know, as we celebrate this national high school coach of the year as well. So you'll be joining us in Denver. Yes. 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 Awesome, man. That's going to be amazing. And in podcast world, that's actually next week because you're listening to this December 4th. I totally forgot to tell you all about this uh, behind the scenes magic here, Justin. It's actually December 4th today. Uh, so next week at uh, in Denver, we'll be there. I can't wait to see you and Ernest, our girls, National High School Coach of the Year there as well. Fun thing we're going to do on Monday. So December 11th, whether you're in Denver or not, you got to pay attention to this. It'll be down in the show notes as well. But December 11th at 530 Denver time. I think that's mountain time. That would make sense, right? Uh, if you're there in Denver at USTF CCCA, we're going to be doing a live uh, recording for the podcast. So you'll be able to come down. We're going to do just, we do five minute chunks at a time. We just get people in and out and just have a good time celebrating coaches there at the convention. And if you're not in Denver, that's okay. It's live. It's on YouTube. So you'll be able to watch and participate over in the comment section. So check the link down below, be there at five 30 mountain time on Monday. And Justin, we'll see you in Denver as well, man. You're going to be on the big stage. Are you going to like take the award and like make a, you know, a necklace out of it or a big ring or what, what are you, what are you doing? With this thing <laughs> I, I i guess first things first i hope i don't drop it and uh i hope i don't break it um i i, I was told by christina that she's gonna mail it to us so that we don't have to worry about damn you know having something happen to it and travel back and forth so i i guess maybe she knows me well to know that uh, <laughs> something like that could happen but yeah um yeah just huge honor and great and great awesome so thank you this will be your first convention Yes, yes. You're going to love it. I mean, it's literally my favorite time of the entire year. And that includes, I get to go to the, all the NCAA championships. And um, a couple months, again, podcast land, a couple months ago, I was at the Prefontaine Classic, the Diamond League Final. And still, I will tell you, my week in December at the USTFCA, it is, it's every quotes there, every coach in the country, uh, their hair down season hasn't really started yet. Uh, learning coaching, education, speaking, uh, it is a phenomenal time. You're going to absolutely enjoy it. You're going to meet a lot of amazing people, uh, that have come before you and that are continuing to move, uh, with you as well. Uh, you're going to expand your network. You're going to, you're going to love it, man. Even though, well, you're in Utah. Forward so I've been looking forward to it for years. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. I love it. Well, Justin, man, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so I'm always humbled. You're, you're a busy, busy person. Being a teacher and a track coach, 365, it's it's always constant. So I'm always humbled when someone would sit down with us here at the Guild Connections podcast and spend hour. We, we've been going at this for two hours, my friend. Uh, I could go two more hours, to be real frank with you. I want to learn more and more and more. And so I'm just so thankful for your time, your openness, your authenticity, man. Uh, you absolutely nailed it. And I'm just so grateful for you and so, so happy for you and the program for the recognition that you're earning this year. Mike, thank you so much again for having me, and I, I thank thank you. I we're we're blessed, and uh, thank you for reaching out and, and giving me giving me an opportunity to to talk about our community and our program and and the great staff that we have. You deserve it, my friend. Thanks for being here, guys. I am so, so grateful that you would join us every week. Like I said, next week, check us out on YouTube Live. The link will be down in the show notes. And we're still going to have an episode too. So we'll also have another coach right here on the Guild Connections podcast, doing it all over again. So super excited. So happy and blessed for Ernest Martinez, the girls, USTF CCCA coach of the year, and Justin Redfern. No fear in Redfern. I was thinking about that as we were going along. I think that's a great tagline. Please steal that. But Justin Redfern here is the boys national high school coach of the year from the USTF CCCA presented by the US Marines. Again, shout out to them for supporting this amazing program. Uh, come back next week, man. We hope to see you here at the Guild Connections podcast. Thanks, everybody. Have an awesome day.